In a post-apocalyptic world infested with zombies, children also need to learn how to protect themselves. Watching the approaching zombies, the little boy Dylan was visibly panicked. Max, seemingly calm, picked up his shotgun. The zombies drew closer, but the gun jammed and couldn't be fired. However, Max didn't choose to run away because he didn't want to lose face in front of Dylan. As the zombies closed in, Dylan kept shouting from the side. Just when the situation became increasingly tense, a loud roar echoed from the sky. Their first reaction was to get down. A plane whizzed past them and crashed straight into the nearby forest, ripping the zombies behind them into two pieces with its propeller. Having narrowly escaped, the two brothers quickly decided to leave. Curiosity led them to the crash site, where thick smoke billowed. Scattered around were some cardboard boxes with faintly visible text. Take what you need, leave what you don't. They didn't have time to carefully examine the boxes as the crashing sound attracted many zombies. The two kids didn't want to linger and prepared to leave. However, a zombie appeared on the road ahead. Although Max had no experience, his sense of responsibility urged him to step forward. He then realized that his submachine gun was jammed. Behind the zombies are also gradually approaching Max was also a bit panicked hands trembling ready to fight with the butt of the gun. Just then, the zombies' heads split in two. Max looked ahead and the dense fog dispersed, revealing a stunning face that left the two boys dumbfounded. It was Alicia, beautiful and capable. Alicia said, we're here to help. Quickly, take shelter inside. The two boys had never seen anyone kill zombies like Alicia did. The helicopter blades in her hands were like reaping blades, and her domineering posture earned the admiration of the two boys. Alicia confronted another zombie and sent it flying. Fear the Walking Dead Season 5 had officially arrived. The people piloting the plane that had come here were Morgan and the others. They had come here to rescue someone named Logan but were forced to crash land due to mechanical issues. Alicia was the first to regain her senses and her priority was killing zombies to buy time for the others. Due to the plane's tilt, Morgan was hanging upside down, unconscious, until the two boys woke him up. Just then, a zombie entered the cabin. Morgan quickly shielded the children behind him, but the zombie pounced on him. Morgan struggled to hold the zombie's neck. John who had awakened, shot the zombie. The two boys asked, who are you and what are you doing here? We're here to help. Are you with Logan? Morgan asked. The two boys didn't know Logan. The situation with Luciana was grim. A steel pipe had pierced through her shoulder. Morgan held her wound to prevent excessive bleeding and comforted her, urging her not to think negatively. Morgan then asked Dylan to help hold down Luciana's wound while he went out to assist Alicia in killing zombies. At this point Alicia has killed her eyes no zombies can block her slash and almost chopped Morgan. Morgan reminded Alicia of her hand. Alicia then notices that her palm is cracked, obviously cut by the weapon in her hand. She's not the same girl she was when she was pouting and talking about pain. Zombies began to approach from all directions again. Alicia asked Morgan, how far are we from the person we're supposed to rescue? Morgan replied, we're about 15 miles off. Despite their dire situation, Morgan remained determined to reach their destination and save the person in need. Alicia didn't say anything and once again took up her weapon. She can't rest now. She has to buy time for her teammates. Soon after, Logan's voice came through Morgan's radio, desperately calling for help. The situation on the other end seemed highly critical, but then, they lost contact, leaving Morgan even more anxious. Just as they finished off a wave of zombies, another group of zombies approached from a distance. Morgan called Alicia back. As the team's top combatant, she had to buy time for her teammates. Alicia began hammering long nails into the ground, a tactic they had learned to kill zombies. After driving in five or six nails, the zombies were almost upon them. Alicia, experienced from countless battles, faced the scene with numbness. She switched the helix to her left hand and Morgan stood ready. Every zombie that approached was tripped by the ropes, greatly reducing their pressure. Their task was to deliver headshots to the zombies. Meanwhile, John brought Naomi and Althea out from the cockpit. Naomi immediately assessed Luciana's condition, and Althea's first priority was finding her camera. However, a zombie lunged at Althea from behind ferociously biting her. Althea was unable to penetrate the zombie's helmet, and it was only because of the zombie's helmet that Althea escaped with her life. Finally Althea pushed the zombies over a steel pipe. Althea then grabbed a video camera to film the strange zombies. John also brought a saw, attempting to cut through the steel pipes. Outside, Alicia and Morgan coordinated to kill the zombies. At one point, while Alicia killed a zombie, she fell onto a protective net. The sign says beware of high radiation areas. It seemed they had arrived at a special place. After a few minutes,
The zombies killed by Alicia and Morgan had piled up into a small hill, breathing heavily. Alicia looked into the distance as more zombies continued to approach. Their energy was severely depleted. Fortunately, Luciana was successfully rescued as well. They could only work together to fight their way out. In the ruins, Althea found Alicia's specialized weapon. Without hesitation, Alicia assigned tasks. I'll clear the way. Morgan cover the left. John cover the right. And the others protect Luciana from harm. The two children were in the middle. In Alicia, it was as if they saw shades of Madison. But she was more decisive and courageous. Alicia took a deep breath. The battle was about to begin. In season 4 of Fear the Walking Dead, it was mentioned that Luciana helped fulfill Clayton's dying wish. Clayton also gave Luciana the address of a factory where he stored his supplies. In the final stage, Morgan led them to find this factory and prepare to establish a survival base there. They used the resources inside to specifically aid people surviving in the apocalypse. One day, Morgan received a distress call from a person named Logan, who claimed that they were heavily surrounded by zombies and in urgent need of help. However, the location was very far away, so they had to travel by plane. Unfortunately, the plane malfunctioned and they were forced to make an emergency landing in a forest, resulting in Luciana getting severely injured. Althea immediately sent a message to Victor, who was at the base, informing him to come and rescue them by piloting the plane. The location of the plane was inside one of the videotapes. The landing is also full of weirdness, with zombies far outnumbering the rest of the place. There's also a sign for high-intensity radiation. There were even zombies wearing seemingly impenetrable armor. Despite the grim situation, Morgan insisted on proceeding to the destination to rescue the survivors. Under Alicia's command, they prepared to fight their way through the zombie horde. Just as they were preparing for the battle, a van suddenly rushed out from a distance, knocking down two zombies before stopping in front of them. To their surprise, the driver turned out to be a girl who appeared to be 15 years old. Max said, this is my sister. They quickly got on the van and left the area. During the journey, Annie mentioned that although the number of zombies here was high, it was the least of their troubles. She warned them that they had no idea where they had ended up. Alicia and Althea also had serious expressions, as they noticed some peculiarities in the area. Persuaded by Morgan, Annie drove them to their intended destination. However, along the way, they encountered a bizarre scene that Annie seemed unfazed by, while the others were astonished. On the road, not only were zombies restrained with the intestines of other zombies, but the heads of zombies were also hanging from the trees. The mouths of the zombies were opening and closing, as if warning people not to set foot in this place. It was truly eerie. Annie claimed she didn't know who did this, as such situations had occurred in many places. Alicia and Althea dealt with the zombies, and the group continued moving forward. After a two and a half hour journey, they arrived at their destination, a truck stop. Alicia glanced inside and saw that it wasn't surrounded by zombies as Logan had claimed. After opening the gate and entering, Alicia knocked on the door, but there was no response. Although the house was well stocked with supplies, they couldn't find a single person. For now, they had to tend to Luciana's wound. Morgan also found a radio and excitedly called Logan repeatedly, informing him that they had arrived. But there was no response. Fortunately, there were some basic medical supplies available here. After inspecting the surroundings, Alicia said to Morgan, There's dust everywhere. It's been a long time since anyone has been here. Something is very wrong. The three kids also sensed that something was amiss, and Annie realized the unusual situation. Instructing her two brothers to grab some supplies and leave quickly, Morgan tried to persuade the kids to come back with them, but they completely ignored him. Their priority now is to fix Luciana's wound. Luckily, Naomi's expertise was strong and she was able to perform the minor surgery without any problems. What they didn't know was that Logan, the man they were trying to rescue, had arrived at the jeans factory and had expertly unlocked the combination lock on the steel door, wearing a truck driver's hat. Logan appeared familiar with the place. Meanwhile, Morgan continued calling Logan on the radio, hoping for a response. Finally, Logan's voice came through the other end, an excited Morgan said, We were worried about you. Where are you? We'll come find you. However, Logan replied, I'm with my people, and we're watching your people. Simultaneously, Victor and Charlie returned to the base only to discover it had been occupied by someone else. Logan continued, saying, The truck you were driving had a C and an L logo. C stands for Clayton, the person who gave you the address. L stands for me. Clayton and I were partners, but I'm not as generous as Clayton. Helping others only causes trouble. Logan added. Morgan asked Logan why he led them to such a distant place. To which Logan stated, 
I want to reclaim what's rightfully mine, but I don't want it to come to bloodshed. Alicia, taking the microphone, expressed her frustration. We almost died flying that plane to save you, and you've taken over our home. Logan merely scoffed at their words. Alicia's emotions reached a boiling point. The group didn't give Victor a hard time. They were ordered to leave immediately, with all their boxes thrown out. At night, Alicia was out killing zombies by herself. She needed to let off steam. Morgan came to console her. Alicia said, We almost died today. If that pipe had been one inch off, Luciana would be dead. We risked our lives to save someone, and they took our home. The kids have distanced themselves from us too. My mother gave her life for me to be here, not for me to die saving others. Morgan replied, If all we care about is eating and sleeping, then what's the point of being alive? If we're alive, we should do something meaningful. I won't give up. Logan doesn't need our help. I'll keep looking for those kids and help them. We've all killed people, and helping others can make up for our mistakes. He added, Alicia says it's just too hard. Without a home, Sarah and the others had no choice but to drive the vehicle into the wilderness. Victor found the videotape Althea mentioned, which revealed the location of the plane. He believed that bringing Morgan and the others back would enable them to reclaim the factory. As Victor watched the tape alone in the armored vehicle, he saw someone that terrified him. The place where the plane was stored had a connection to Daniel, and Victor shook his head, hesitating to continue searching for the plane. On a rainy night in the apocalypse, Althea found a zombies wearing armor nailed to the ground. Curious, she decided to open the helmet to see what was underneath, only to reveal a plain and pale face. Althea kills the zombies with a knife. In the daytime, Althea noticed the unique attire of the zombies and thought she could capture something interesting. Indeed, the armor worn by the zombies had a remarkably distinct material that even zombies found difficult to bite through. Additionally, Althea discovered some paper materials on the zombies. After completing her filming, Althea quickly took out her walkie-talkie and contacted Morgan to share her findings from the trip. Just then, a dark figure approached Althea from behind. Althea was electrocuted and fell to the ground. The figure was also wearing a suit of armor. Meanwhile, Victor, watching the recorded footage, discovered that the plane he was searching for was located at Daniel's place. The following morning, Victor opened the recording device and left behind some final words. He intended to go alone to find Daniel and borrow the helicopter. However, the enmity between Victor and Daniel might lead to a fatal outcome for Victor. Without alerting Sarah and the others, Victor set out on his own. The audience familiar with Victor knows that he used to be a selfish person who would never put himself in danger for others. But now, he has changed. He is willing to take risks for his friends. Victor arrived at the described location in the recording and found it filled with roadblocks, clearly intended to fend off zombies. Just as he reached the entrance, a small cat ran toward him, followed by his zombies. Before Victor could take action, the zombies tripped on a spiked obstacle, which pierced its head. Soon after, Victor heard the sound of a rifle being loaded behind him. Victor raised his hands without turning around. Knowing that Daniel was the one holding the gun, he said, I know that if you see my face and hear my voice, you might shoot without hesitation, but can we talk first? He then turned around and confirmed that it was indeed Daniel. Daniel didn't show any particular animosity towards Victor and allowed him to come inside for a conversation. Once inside, Victor was amazed to see various modes of transportation filling the place. Daniel asked why Victor had come and what he wanted from him. Victor mentioned that he heard Daniel had a small plane and he wanted to borrow it. Hearing that Victor knew about it from Althea, Daniel understood how Victor had found his location. Victor explained that his friends were in danger and needed the plane for rescue. Daniel laughed and asked if it was Madison and the others who were in trouble. Victor's expression turned sad, and he replied that Madison was already dead. Daniel's smile vanished instantly. Victor continued, saying that Nick was also dead, but Alicia was alive and needed rescue. Daniel started laughing again and said, why don't you tell the truth? In Daniel's eyes, Victor was a selfish and deceitful person, always acting in his own interests. On the other side, John arrived at the location where the plane went down, searching for Althea. Besides the wreckage, even the armored zombies were nowhere to be found. Even the weapons and ammunition inside the plane wreckage were taken. It was evident that someone had taken Althea. They divided their tasks to search for her. Morgan and Alicia prepared to explore the northern region, while John returned to the truck stop to search the southern area with Naomi, Luciana who was injured, stayed at the truck stop and maintained contact with Victor. Soon, Morgan and Alicia encountered an obstacle on the road. Three vehicles blocked their way, with a sign saying danger. 
Stay away from high radiation zone, they didn't dare to enter without caution, Alicia noticed a strange vehicle with some residual heat on the hood, making them alert, but there's no one around, there was only one gap in the distance, and that was a path, they followed the path, and soon they split up to investigate the situation, after walking for a few minutes, Morgan came across a surprising scene, two zombies were attracted by a crow inside a cage, quietly, Morgan approached and took down the first zombie with a stick. As he prepared to deal with the second one, his leg was caught by a thrown weapon, causing him to fall alongside the zombie. Suddenly, a foot kicked the zombie away, and then a gunshot rang out. With a gun pointed at Morgan, it was a woman in protective gear. She ordered Morgan to strip off all his clothes. Confused, Morgan looked at her, puzzled by her actions. The woman put the gun away and removed what was hanging on the zombie's bodies. Seeing that Morgan didn't remove his clothes, she took out the gun again, however, Alicia leaped onto the woman from a distance, pressing the barrel of her weapon against the woman's shed. Alicia asked Grace where Althea was. Grace says I don't know what you're talking about but I can make sure you lose one less friend. Grace informed them that not far from there, a reactor had melted down, and the people who went to fix it all died. The zombies with the cylindrical devices attached to them were the workers who were repairing the reactor. They carried some dangerous particles. Perhaps some particles had already gotten onto Morgan, and he needs to clean up. The method of decontamination involved taking a special shower, ensuring that every inch of skin was cleansed. Grace also prepared a set of clothes and shoes for Morgan. Alicia also learned about this cylindrical radiation measuring device and saw that zombies wearing this thing must stay far away. Alicia asked Grace if it was her who set up the zombies to block their way on the road. Grace replied, I only put up signs. When you encounter something eerie like that, it's best to stay far away. In the previous episode, it was mentioned that Althea was taken away after being stunned by someone while trying to film a uniquely styled zombie. The next day, Lisa, Morgan, and Grace set off towards the north in search of Althea and the children. On their journey, they encountered Grace, a worker from a nuclear power plant. Morgan and the others also learned that some zombies have very strong radiation and cannot be touched at all. Meanwhile, John and Naomi headed south in search of something but ultimately found nothing. Victor, who stayed at the factory, found Daniel, whom he hadn't seen for a long time. Daniel had a helicopter, which could be used to rescue Morgan and the group. However, Daniel was skeptical of Victor and didn't trust everything he said. To prove the truth of his words, Victor borrowed Daniel's radio and successfully contacted Luciana, who was stationed at the truck stop. Victor was so excited that he told Luciana, don't worry Daniel is an old acquaintance of ours, I'll come and pick you up in my plane. However, their communication got cut off for some reason, but Victor's claim was indeed true. Daniel seemed to understand that Alicia and the others were in a precarious situation. He didn't say a word and simply asked Victor to accompany him outside. Victor assumed they were going to get the helicopter, but Daniel told him it was time for him to leave. Just as Victor wondered why Daniel wouldn't help his friends, Daniel explained that Alicia had a strong ability, like her mother, and Luciana was a determined person, he believed they could survive and refused to give Victor the plane because he would only make their situation worse. Daniel emphasized that nobody knew Victor better than him. Though reluctant, Victor had no choice but to leave under Daniel's threat. Luciana and the others were still waiting for him to arrive with the plane, but now their plans had been ruined. Victor vented his frustration on the passing zombies. Meanwhile, Luciana, who had lost contact with Victor, sensed something outside, she went out alone and discovered a collapsed antenna. Explaining the interruption in communication, Luciana used the radio to inform John and the others that Victor would come with the plane soon. Naomi expressed joy upon hearing the news. At that moment, several zombies started appearing in the forest. Despite her injured left hand, Luciana took out her gun, but the pain from her wound made her hand tremble. The excruciating pain shot through her shoulder with every movement. She couldn't aim accurately and failed to hit the zombies' heads even after firing two shots. Luciana hurried back inside, closing the door, but the pain combined with intense nervousness caused her to faint. The zombies continued to pound on the iron door. After an unknown period, Luciana woke up to find Naomi standing in front of her. Not zombies. Luciana regained her composure and asked about the whereabouts of the zombies. The zombies that had been at the door were now hanging on a billboard. This eerie behavior indicated that someone was threatening them and also meant they were getting closer to something. John stated that their priority was to find Althea and the children and wait for Victor to pick them up. The next step is to find the mysterious group that took Althea, which may be the same group that used the zombies as a roadblock on the road. Morgan and Alicia are strong fighters on their own. Naomi and John make up a team, without a doubt. 
Roadblocks were set up at every intersection, and they would inform Luciana and mark the locations on the map after clearing each area. Eventually, it turns out that the barricades seemed to be forming a barrier to keep outsiders out. John and Naomi drove towards the next intersection to determine the extent of the border and narrow down the search area for Althea. Due to the distance, they had lost contact with Morgan and the others via the radio. Soon, they encountered another roadblock and decided to venture deeper into the area for investigation. Just as they were preparing to deal with the zombies, gunshots rang out. John grabbed Naomi and hid behind the car. Despite John's assertion that they didn't want trouble, it was evident that the other party was intent on killing them. They had no choice but to leave the area immediately, disregarding the zombies ahead and slammed on the accelerator to speed past them. With no clear idea of the enemy's firepower and unable to contact Alicia and the others, they needed to find a place to replenish their ammunition as soon as possible. Immediately after John saw a road sign, Our luck just turned again. John was coming to a place that all men dream of, a small town that belonged only to cowboys in the west, where they could probably find guns and ammunition. True to their expectations, they quickly arrived at a cowboy bar in the town and John discovered a storage area for ammunition, they were not disappointed. As the wind started picking up in the town, they prepared to leave and continue their search for Althea's whereabouts. Just as they were about to leave in the car, they heard familiar gunshots, and their tires were immediately punctured. John and Naomi sought cover in the nearest available place. The gunshots quickly attracted zombies from a distance. The shooter seemed to have a haphazard shooting style, lacking any finesse. John, the sharpshooter, shot him in the arm. John saw him running away and quickly chased after him. John chased him to the side, but the man disappeared. Behind him there were two zombies approaching. John skillfully dispatched the zombies with his firearms, but a pistol was aimed at his head. Before him stood a scar-faced man. The first thing the man says is to ask John where she is. And naturally John has no idea what he's talking about. The man became highly agitated threatening to kill John if he didn't provide the information. Fortunately, Naomi launched a surprise attack from behind, knocking him unconscious. A large number of zombies are quickly gathering here. They choose to save the man and tie him to a post to prevent him from attacking, while John searched the man's belongings. Naomi tended to his wounds. It was apparent that the man was also searching for someone and had mistaken John and Naomi for someone else, leading him to open fire. The man quickly regained consciousness and was visibly displeased with John touching his belongings. Through their careful explanations, the man's emotions became less volatile. John said, We are also looking for someone. We can exchange information. Do you know who is using zombies as roadblocks? The man simply replied, No one can help me. This place is about to go to hell. After a while, the number of zombies outside continued to increase, and John had no choice but to reinforce the barricades with tables and chairs. The man seemed to realize that John and Naomi were not bad people, and he told John, My car is parked at the entrance of the town. The keys are on top. You can take it and leave. John insisted on taking the man with them and untied the rope from his body. John understood the man's situation, as he had faced immense difficulties when searching for Naomi. The man opened up and revealed his name as Dwight. He was searching for his wife. John held out his hand and they became friends. They came up with a plan to attract zombies by making the piano play automatically, creating a continuous sound to draw them in. Eventually, the zombies broke through the obstacles and entered the building. John and the others escaped through a window on the second floor, but the metal sheet beneath them seemed unable to support their weight. Dwight glanced at John's car, which was not far away, and jumped down. However, he stumbled and hit his injured arm, attracting the attention of the zombies. Fortunately, Naomi shot them and saved him. John jumped down and pulled Dwight up, but the gunshots attracted more zombies. Naomi came down the other way. Now they had to reach the car as quickly as possible. Dwight's combat ability was already low, and with his injury, it was even lower. They cooperated to kill the zombies. Naomi had already made her way to the car, bypassing the zombies. At this moment, the number of zombies was still manageable, and they could easily reach the car and leave. However, Dwight stopped in his tracks and looked at the car John had driven earlier. After hesitating, Dwight ran towards that car, with the zombies close behind. It was only when John got in the car that he realized Dwight hadn't followed. By that time, Dwight had already gotten into the car. Once inside the car, Dwight searched frantically but couldn't find what he was looking for. John tried to contact Dwight through the radio repeatedly. Dwight was feeling incredibly hopeless at the moment, and he told John his story. He had been searching for his wife for over a year, traveling almost across the entire country. His wife would always leave a mark at each place they stopped, 
The last mark she left was on the vehicle registration of that car. Dwight had been searching for that car for several months. That was also why he had shot at John and the others earlier. However, now there were no further clues inside the car. And he was mentally and physically exhausted. He's hit a brick wall in his search and maybe his wife is gone. Dwight pleaded with John to tell him where he found the car. John hesitated because the place where he found the car was already full of zombies. Naomi could sense John's dilemma and relayed the message to Dwight. Dwight breaks down and says I'm always two or three steps behind and I'm really tired of looking. I've done more than you can imagine to find her. Just let me stay here. They could tell that Dwight might be contemplating suicide at this point. Naomi began to console him from a woman's perspective. Even if her words were harsh, they deeply touched Dwight's heart. In the end, Dwight gave up on taking his own life. But he was surrounded by zombies, making it difficult to escape. John stated that as long as he didn't want to die, there was always a way. Naomi told Dwight that once they cleared a path, he should run quickly. The sharpshooter John skillfully shot multiple zombies with pinpoint accuracy, while other zombies started converging towards him. Within a few minutes, only a few zombies remained around the car. Dwight also rushed out with his axe, and just as he chopped a zombie, he was crushed by the zombie's body. John ran out of bullets, and Naomi's gun had only one round left. While there were two zombies approaching, John simply said, Enough! Just as the zombies were about to reach Dwight, John aimed the gun and shouted, Raise the axe blade towards me! Dwight summoned all his strength and lifted the axe. John took a deep breath and then fired a single shot, splitting the bullet in two and killing both zombies. It was a miraculous feat. They ultimately turned the tables and escaped the danger. At night, Morgan and the others arrived in Cowboy Town to join John and the others. At that moment, Dwight tentatively called out Morgan's name. Morgan looked at Dwight in disbelief and then smiled. Morgan explained, We come from the same place. Those familiar with The Walking Dead would know the stories of Dwight, Rick, and others. Although they had been adversaries in the past, Morgan firmly believed that everyone could start anew. They briefly reminisced about the past. Alicia asked Dwight, Do you know what those zombies blocking the road are all about? What are they trying to prevent us from reaching? Dwight replied, I've reached a dead end myself. But I can take you to a place I've been to before, where there are even more roadblock zombies. Dwight said, I've tried to go around, but there are more zombies in other places than here. They are willing to do whatever it takes to kill every zombie as long as they can save their comrades. The zombies were arranged like a fence, blocking the way for the group. Seasoned survivors like Alicia were not easily intimidated. In order to find Althea, Alicia gave the order to wipe out all the zombies, just as they were about to do it. Alicia's walkie-talkie went off and the voice of the boy, Max, came through. Max said they were in trouble and heading towards the truck stop. Without knowing what had happened to the kids, they had no choice but to find them first. The two vehicles rushed towards the truck stop at full speed. Alicia smiled with relief because the children had sought their help, making her feel that their efforts had gained the children's trust. A few minutes later, they spotted the kids' car parked on the side of the road. An ominous feeling lingered in their hearts. The car was covered in intestines and guts from the zombies. Morgan opened the car door, revealing a blood-covered boy curled up in the seat. It was Dylan, the youngest of them all. Fear was evident on Dylan's face. Alicia hurried forward to comfort Dylan. It was apparent that Max and Annie had encountered something unfortunate, but the truth was far from that. At this moment, Max and Annie were using zombies to create roadblocks. They're the ones who've been setting up roadblocks at intersections to scare outsiders into leaving. Now they were deceiving Morgan's group as well. They wanted Dylan to act as a spy and find out the purpose of Morgan's group coming here. Because Morgan and Alicia have been looking for them every day, claiming to help them. They only wished for Morgan and the others to leave as soon as possible and never disturb them again. Dylan, brought to the truck stop, received their preferential treatment. Dylan eavesdropped on Alicia and Morgan's conversation, and they believed Althea had been taken deep into the forest by mysterious people. Dylan immediately claimed that there was nothing in the forest, and he knew the location of the mysterious people's camp. Alicia wondered why he hadn't mentioned it when they first met. Morgan assumed that Dylan must have been scared and forgot. Then Dylan pointed out the camp on the map, which was located on the outskirts of the forest. Dylan's intention was for Morgan and Alicia to search towards the outskirts. If they searched inside the forest, their roadblocks would be cleared sooner or later. Armed with the location information, Alicia and Morgan swiftly took action. Luciana needs to get a signal tower up to get in touch with Black. While the house is empty, 
The boy pulls out his walkie-talkie and gets in touch with Max and the others. Max informed them that the roadblocks in their area had been removed again. Dylan found it very strange because he had already deceived Morgan's group to the outskirts of the forest. Dylan also mentioned that they had no ill intentions and were only searching for their friend. Max wondered who else it could be if not them. At that moment, a distant voice could be heard and a figure clad in armor was seen killing zombies. Due to the unique material of the armor, the person engaged in close combat with the zombies without any fear of being bitten. They had to hide in the bushes and didn't dare to make a sound. Just as the person was about to leave, Dylan's voice came through the walkie-talkie, startling Max, who quickly turned it off. Dylan's voice also caught Luciana's attention, but luckily, Dylan reacted quickly, and Luciana didn't see his walkie-talkie. However, Dylan started to worry that something must have happened to Max and the others. Meanwhile, Morgan and Alicia arrived at the location Dylan had mentioned. The place was desolate, with no trace of human activity. Morgan radioed Luciana, informing her that they were planning to investigate further with Alicia. Dylan panics, grabs the radio, and asks Morgan to get to the old highway. Morgan said they were currently busy searching for Althea to avoid tragedies like what happened to your brother and sister. Dylan finally admitted his mistake. Max and the others were not dead. They were probably in serious trouble. It was another blow to Alicia's mind. They always helped others but were often taken advantage of and deceived. The two children hiding in the woods silently prayed not to be discovered. Fortunately, after a while, the mysterious person had left. However, the rope's quality was poor, and the zombies broke free, overwhelming Annie and knocking her to the ground. Luckily, Max didn't panic and managed to drag Annie out, narrowly escaping disaster. However, Annie's leg was injured, and Max could only support her as they hurriedly fled. With zombies relentlessly pursuing them, they ran towards the woods. Their leg injuries made them as fast as the zombies, and they finally fell to the ground due to exhaustion. Max bravely positioned himself in front of Annie. Just as the zombies were about to pounce, Morgan and Alicia arrived in time to rescue them. Killing four zombies was effortless for Morgan and Alicia. Max and Annie instinctively stepped back, but Morgan signaled them not to be nervous and assured them that he wouldn't harm them. However, a dozen children emerged from the woods, wielding weapons and surrounding Morgan and Alicia. It turned out to be an organization formed by a group of children. Morgan and Alicia had no choice but to drop their weapons. Dylan and Annie said they were really just looking for their friends. And they helped you. Annie gestured for the others to put down their weapons as well. Alicia asked if they could tell them who those mysterious people were, as they were deeply concerned about Althea's safety. Max stated that they could help find their friends but wouldn't leave the area, as they didn't need their assistance. Alicia was extremely puzzled. Morgan seemed to have figured out the reason. They had previously arrived at a camp where they were trapped inside a house surrounded by many zombies who had died from radiation exposure. Those must have been the parents of these children. Tears welled up in the children's eyes as Morgan spoke. These children were orphaned and had no one to rely on, so they armed themselves and took care of each other. They didn't want to leave because they couldn't let go of their parents, so they rejected outsiders. They then take Morgan and the others on a quest to find the mysterious man. When Alicia asked how many people there were, Max stated that they had only seen two. After walking for a few minutes, Max seemed to hear something and quickly shouted for everyone to get down. Just as Alicia was puzzled, a thunderous roar erupted, and the force of the helicopter's propellers made it hard to keep one's eyes open. Above them appeared a helicopter with a biohazard symbol, flying higher and higher before heading towards the distance. Annie explained that those mysterious people arrived by helicopter. Max is still wondering why they suddenly left. Annie suggested that perhaps they had found what they were looking for. Alicia also realized that something was wrong, and if they'd left then where was Althea? What had happened to Althea on that night? In the previous episode, in their quest to find Althea, Alicia, and others, they were preparing to search for the mysterious person's camp, only to find they had already left by helicopter. The question remains, is Althea alive or dead? The story returns to the night of the plane crash. Althea was filming the zombies in their armor when a man in black crept up and electrocuted her. Waking up in the cold rain, Althea found her hands bound, struggling for a few seconds to no avail. Observing her surroundings, she noticed a figure in armor, identical to the zombies on the ground. The armored figure was sprinkling something on a zombie before igniting it with a special method, spotting her backpack nearby. Althea seized it and started to run away. Unnoticed at first due to the sound of the rain, by the time the person in black realized, Althea had already disappeared into the woods. Tripping in the bushes, Althea decided to stop running and remove the tape from her camera. Having lost her shoes, she chose to run towards an open plain, only to encounter three zombies. 
Althea was about to use the camera in her hand as a weapon, when a gunshot rang out and the zombies fell to the ground. The assailant, who knocked out Althea with the butt of his gun, was revealed to be a woman when Althea kicked off her helmet. The woman dismantled Althea's tapes without finding the one she was looking for, which Althea had hidden somewhere. Althea was then tied to a vehicle by the woman, surrounded by a circular wire fence. Thinking quickly, Althea opened a door with her bare foot and attracted a zombie to the fence. The zombies heard the noise and came towards Althea. When the zombies got close, Althea kicked the zombies away and hooked the barbed wire with her foot. It took Althea a great deal of effort to cut the rope from her hand, and then the zombies were killed. Armed with her camera, Althea crossed the forest to find a cool-looking helicopter, which she couldn't start due to low fuel. Attempting to radio for Morgan and others, she received no response until a man's voice asked for a response from Ground Team 17. Just as Althea was wondering, the woman had returned. The radio kept asking for Team 17, and the woman, Isabel, responded that the team leader had died of radiation. Inquiring about the cargo, Isabel assured its safety and promised to return within 72 hours despite the helicopter's fuel issue. The radio operator announced the dispatch of a recovery team. Althea realized they were dealing with a mysterious organization and inquired about the recovery team, which Isabel refused to discuss. Isabel threatened Althea for the tapes, even considering breaking her leg but was met with Althea's determination to know the truth. As Isabel makes her move, Althea says, You've lost a companion, but you don't seem to be upset. You started to panic when you heard they were sending a recovery team. Did you cause trouble that they now want to kill you for? Seeing Althea's strong stance, Isabel refrained from being ruthless. She prepared to take Althea to find fuel, gathering many climbing tools, and revealed that the helicopter's fuel was on the mountain summit. They then set off in a car. Althea was very interested in Isabel's story. Along the way, they encountered a landslide and a few scattered zombies. Isabel took off her clothes to give to Althea for protection, before Althea could help. Isabel effortlessly killed three zombies with her weapon, but then, a landslide hit their car from behind. Althea, in search of her camera, was bitten on the arm by a zombie buried in the dirt, but was saved by her special armor. Isabel understood that Althea was similar to her, willing to risk her life for her beliefs. Their relationship deepened. Isabel warned Althea to be afraid of people dressed like her. They soon arrived at the foot of the mountain, where many hikers had once been. They rested there for the night, becoming friends through their conversation. The next morning, they started climbing. The journey was perilous, but they successfully reached the summit. Isabel spoke of her teammate, revealing she killed him for violating their work principles and trying to leave the organization. Our mission must remain secret, so I had to kill him, she explained. Althea realized Isabel might also kill her after getting the tapes. Isabel didn't deny it, saying it was necessary. At that moment, they encountered a climber turned zombie at the summit. As Isabel dealt with the zombie, Althea attacked from behind, easily overpowering Isabel and taking her weapon. Althea then grabbed two barrels of fuel and was going to leave Isabel here. She was going to fly a helicopter and take Morgan and the others out of here. Isabel warned Althea that if the recovery team arrived, everyone around the helicopter would be killed, with no choice. Isabel offered to tell her story to Althea, who stayed for the sake of the story. Isabel said she couldn't reveal where she came from, describing it as the most important place in the world. Our actions are for rebuilding our home. The tape must be destroyed. If its contents are seen by others, everything we've done will be vulnerable. With the world destroyed, will anyone see the stories you film? Althea understood the importance of Isabel's words, just as her stories were to her. Althea agreed to find the tape, prepared to be killed by Isabel. The next day, Althea led Isabel to where she had the tape, concealed on a zombie's body. Trusting Althea wouldn't deceive her, Isabel burned the tape without checking. To ensure the mission's secrecy, Althea had to die, but Isabel couldn't bring herself to do it. Asking Althea to turn around, Althea said she understood what Isabel was doing and said some goodbyes. Isabel didn't do it in the end. She told Althea not to try to find them and not to tell anyone because Isabel had fallen in love with Althea. They parted ways. Isabel refueled the helicopter and reported to her organization, which recalled the recovery team. The helicopter then flew into the sky, watching the departing helicopter. Althea felt melancholic. She radioed Morgan, who responded after two calls and eventually found Althea. They hugged and Althea didn't tell them what had happened to her in the past few days, but simply lied about it. Their next step was to get the hell out of there. What happened to Victor who went to borrow a plane? 
This may be the smartest cat in the zombie series. At its owner's command, the cat weaves through the zombie's vicinity. The cat draws the zombie's attention, allowing its owner to safely eliminate them, significantly reducing the danger. Daniel, although aged, still possesses the skills of a former professional assassin, effortlessly killing a few isolated zombies. Arriving at the entrance of a mall, Daniel sees a gramophone playing music inside and a machine gun aimed at the door, set to fire upon anyone opening it. Anticipating this, Daniel stands beside the door and gently pushes it open. The machine gun is triggered, firing for a full three seconds. Immediately after, Daniel takes out a zombie inside and hauls away the supplies and weapons, marking the location with an X on a map, indicating many traps in the area. Daniel lives in a place abundant with supplies and weapons, accompanied only by a small orange cat. The cat seemed to sense something in the early hours of the morning. A girl arrives in Daniel's yard, with Victor, Sarah, and others waiting in an armored vehicle outside. Their goal is to find the plane's location for Charlie. It's Victor's only choice. As Morgan and the others are still waiting for the plane to rescue them, Charlie makes her way to the backyard and finally spots the plane on a trailer. Joyfully relaying this news to Victor, Victor told Charlie to find a place to hide until Daniel went out and opened the gate. The cat quietly approaches Charlie's feet. Just then, the sound of a door opening is heard. As Daniel prepares to leave, with the cat following Charlie, she has no choice but to climb into the trunk of the car, which happens to be the one Daniel is about to use. Daniel opens the car door, places his gun inside, seemingly unaware of Charlie's presence. After placing his gun, he closes the door. Charlie quickly pops her head out, radioing Victor that she's hiding in Daniel's car and he's about to leave. Victor, worried, urges Charlie to get out of the car, ready to storm in with a gun if necessary. Charlie, not wanting any conflict, tells them to stay put, assuring she can handle the situation, then turns off the radio and continues to hide. And with that, Daniel drove out. Victor and his team finally located the airplane, ready to bring Morgan and the others back from their location, eagerly sitting in the cockpit. Victor discovered several crucial instrument panels were missing, making it impossible to fly. Victor reluctantly informed Sarah of this, only to notice a note on the windshield reading, I told you I wouldn't lend it to you, contact me on channel 8. Victor drew his handgun, suspecting Daniel might be nearby and hadn't left. He then used the radio to contact Daniel on channel 8, asking, where are you, Daniel? Daniel responded, relax, I'm not near the warehouse, but if I return and find you there, prepare to become a zombie, Victor inquired, how did you know I would try to steal the plane, Daniel coolly replied, I know you too well, you haven't changed at all, Sarah is also on the intercom and says that Victor shot at you once and you had good reason to do so, but can you lend me the plane, Daniel warned her to stay away from Victor, accusing him of exploiting a child for his dirty work, clearly aware of the girl hiding in his car, but assured, I won't harm her, now, without the necessary parts, the plane couldn't be started. Victor reflected on his actions, realizing Daniel's deep prejudice against him was likely due to the shooting incident. Meanwhile, Charlie asked Daniel, where are you taking me? Daniel didn't answer directly, simply stating, I won't harm you, you're just a child. Their journey was surprisingly pleasant, with Daniel even playing music, showing a rare moment of contentment. They stopped at a convenience store, where Daniel, as usual, surveyed the premises. Inside was a machine gun set to trigger upon opening the door, but the store was overrun with zombies, making the usual approach unfeasible. Charlie suggested sneaking in from the back, a method she used for stealing, but emphasized she wouldn't kill for it. Daniel clarified, you think I set these traps and kill other survivors? The warehouse I live in now was taken from someone who did that. My goal is to dismantle their traps to prevent innocent deaths. Then they came to the back door and Daniel took out his knife and started to pry it open. The cat, thinking its owner needed its help to distract the zombies, approached the glass. The zombies moved towards the glass, accidentally hitting the machine gun on the table. Hearing the gunfire, Daniel realized something was wrong and urgently called for Charlie to run. The machine gun, moved by the zombies, shattered the glass door, and the zombies spilled out of the store. They both quickly fled to the car, with the cat swiftly jumping aboard. Daniel drove slowly because Charlie was in the car. Charlie asked why Daniel didn't use his weapons to kill all the zombies, but Daniel explained that the small group of zombies wasn't a significant threat. Firing guns would attract more zombies from the surroundings. Charlie didn't understand, arguing they could outrun the zombies, but Daniel pointed out that the zombie horde would grow and eventually pose a danger to others. Daniel said they lured the zombies to the warehouse, 
where the door could block the zombies and then wipe them out. Daniel was helping strangers in his own way. Charlie then contacted Wendell and others at the warehouse. Victor asked where Daniel had put the necessary plane parts. Daniel pointed to the backpack. Inside the backpack were the parts they needed. Daniel remarked that he wouldn't have left them in an obvious place. Victor pleaded with Daniel to return the parts, as their friends' lives were at risk. Daniel and Charlie's pleasant interaction convinced him to lend the plane. Daniel said we're coming back but we're bringing a bunch of friends with us. Close my door and we'll go over the wall. But Sarah interrupted Daniel and said I'm so sorry I had to break down your wall to get the plane out. Daniel chuckled, leaving Charlie confused. Daniel remarked that if returning put her in danger, how would he be any different from Victor? Deciding to act, Daniel stopped the car. Although young, Charlie had learned to drive. Daniel asked her to drive the parts back while he would deal with the zombies. Exiting the car, he turned on the music to lure the zombies elsewhere. Charlie's presence had changed Daniel's mood, reminding him of his daughter, whose last moments he missed. A pain only a father could understand. Back at the warehouse, Victor was surprised at how easily they obtained the parts. Sarah urged to quickly install them and see if the plane would start. Victor, feeling guilty, apologized over the radio for his past actions, including trying to kill Daniel and causing him pain. He hoped Daniel wasn't endangering himself just to teach Victor a lesson. Daniel said, Do you still think I'm blaming you for shooting at me? Confused, Victor asked, Then why? Daniel replied, Your problem has always been one thing lies. He urged Victor to tell the others how he had prevented Daniel from finding his daughter. With a sigh, Victor confessed, Daniel got separated from his daughter to save my own life. I lied to him, claiming I knew where his daughter was. This wasted his precious time in searching for her. By the time Daniel finally found his daughter, it was already too late. Guys, we can't just leave him behind. The old man walks along the highway with a speaker, followed by countless zombies. He's been leading the zombies away for two hours to ensure the safety of others, exhausting him greatly. At this moment, the walkie-talkie rang, and it was Victor who spoke. He said, I'm sorry about your daughter. I'm not asking you to forgive me. I just want you to give me a chance to prove myself. I'm not the selfish person I used to be. Let us help you. Just as he finished speaking Daniel heard the sound of a car in front of him. A speeding armored car comes into view and blocks the road. Hug the fan, Dan. Daniel, weary but undeterred, runs towards it. Wendell opened his weapon box and had two machine guns ready to fire as Daniel approached the car. Daniel finally reached the side of the car. Wendell is excited to pull the switch for the first time, but the machine guns don't respond. This is a bit embarrassing. Wendell is also puzzled by the situation at this critical moment. The zombies are closing in. Wendell pulls the weapon switch again, but still nothing happens. Daniel, signaling frantically, urges them to open the vehicle's door. Sarah, about to pull Daniel into the driver's cabin, sees the zombies almost upon them. Daniel had the bright idea to get underneath the car. Sarah closed the door again. The zombies had completely surrounded the vehicle, with Daniel still under it, desperately fighting off the attacking zombies with his knife. Just then, Victor arrived in a tow truck. When he saw the scene, he got out of the car and came to the armored car. Then he shouted to attract the zombies. Daniel also got a chance to catch his breath. The zombies began to move towards Victor, who then climbed into an airplane and started its propellers. He had thought of a way to eliminate all the zombies. As the zombies got closer to the plane's spinning propellers, a gruesome scene was about to unfold. Daniel and Sarah, still under the car, realized what Victor was planning to do. Any zombie that touched the propellers was instantly turned into a mist of blood, quickly covering the plane's windshield in fresh blood. Wendell, watching from a distance, felt a chill down his spine. The propellers worked like meat grinders, and this process continued for a relentless 10 minutes, after which the propellers were completely destroyed, leaving a scene of dismembered carnage. Victor immediately helped Daniel up and returned his hat to him. This behavior has made Daniel reacquaint himself with Victor, who may not really be the same as he used to be and is no longer the self-serving liar he used to be. Back at base, Daniel started packing his things. He told Charlie that he needed to stay behind for a reason and had some things to take care of. Charlie said, Do you need company? Daniel smiled in relief and said, Your friends need you. Daniel told them they could use whatever they wanted here. And then he left. Victor spoke to Luciana and said that the plane's engine was damaged beyond repair, but that he would find another way to save them. The damage to the plane meant they couldn't rescue Morgan and his team. Luciana and the others, though disheartened by this news, didn't give up. 
They found the wreckage of the crashed plane and started trying to repair it in hopes of escaping the mountain. Morgan's team and the children gathered, each face filled with determination and hope, firmly believing they could work together to repair the plane. The repair work was in full swing, with almost everyone participating. Whenever they encountered technical problems, they contacted Victor's team via radio and made adjustments by comparing the structures of their respective planes. After several days of repair, the plane was finally taking shape and ready for a test start. Althea sat in the cockpit and pressed the start button. Everyone watched the propeller with hope as the reduction gear slowly started turning, gaining speed. Smiles appeared on everyone's faces, but the joy was short-lived. Althea, hearing the gear's unusual noise, and the others outside also noticed something was wrong. The reduction gear was faltering. Luciana quickly warned everyone to take cover. A blade from the gear was flung out. But fortunately, no one was injured. They looked at the welded propeller with a sense of loss, realizing that they needed a new propeller to take off. Just then, a zombie walked into the fenced area. Alicia, holding a propeller, was about to kill the zombie to vent her frustration, but Morgan was quicker and killed the zombie with one strike. Morgan then comforted everyone. His walkie-talkie rang. It was Grace, a worker from the nuclear power plant. She asked Morgan if they had a generator as she needed it because another reactor was having problems. The temperature was too high and couldn't be cooled down. She needed the generator to prevent another nuclear radiation leak, which would kill everyone. Alicia and Morgan didn't hesitate and began dismantling the generator. Alicia asked if it could be fixed, but Grace said it could only delay the inevitable. They needed to hurry and fix the plane to leave the area. Luciana had a final conversation with Victor, informing him of their situation, as the power outage would cut off their communication. Victor, though promising to find a way to help, had no clue how to proceed. Morgan's team had an engine but no propeller, while Victor's team had the opposite, a propeller but no engine. Sometimes, fate plays such tricks on people. Charlie, looking at a promotional poster for Jim's beer on the wall, asked Sarah if they were sure they had taken everything from Jim's brewery. She then brought the poster to Sarah. Sarah, looking at the poster, laughed and said that this time they were definitely going to bring them back. Inside the truck stop, Annie decided to leave with the other children, not believing anyone could protect them. The failure of the plane's repair and the children's departure left Alicia somewhat disheartened. Just then, Luciana's walkie-talkie rang with Victor's voice. Technically, the walkie-talkie shouldn't have been able to receive a signal from such a distance without a base station. Victor, with a laugh, said, Luciana, your voice sounds so nice. I'm coming. I said I would find a way to save you all. Alicia is agitated and asks where the hell he is. Victor replied that they had brought a propeller and advised them to look towards the southern sky. Alicia looks up and sees a giant beer bottle floating in the distance from the top of the hill. Victor and Alicia who brought the propeller, and they found the hot air balloon that Jim's beer used to advertise. Alicia and Luciana burst out laughing. Althea and Naomi saw it too. Even Morgan, who was far away, saw it. It was more than just a balloon. It was a symbol of hope. When Alicia excitedly prepared to show the children this symbol of hope, she realized they had already left the place. Annie only trusted herself to protect them. Morgan urged Alicia to quickly find the children, as their time was running short. At this moment, an unexpected situation arose. Unexpectedly, Victor's balloon was low on fuel and might not be able to fly over the forest, forcing them to land. Morgan, realizing the gravity of the situation, hurriedly told Victor through the radio that he was on his way and instructed them to stay put. He warned against killing zombies recklessly, as some of them carried strong radiation. Morgan, unable to worry about the risks, also ran into the quarantine zone. Victor and Alicia, who landed safely, attracted many zombies with the noise of their landing. Some of the zombies had cylinders hanging from their bodies, a sign that they were infected by radiation, although Morgan had told them to stay away from zombies. It seemed impossible now as the zombies were getting close. On the other side, Alicia arrived at the children's residence, where they were still using zombies as their shield. However, this time there were unprecedented numbers of zombies. After thinking for two minutes, Alicia decided to take them away, pulling out her weapon and preparing for a fierce battle. Seeing the zombies closing in, Victor had no choice but to open fire. Morgan had warned them about zombies with cylinders on their chests indicating high levels of radiation, and instructed not to act rashly. Victor and Charlie could only retreat to maintain distance, with Charlie distracting the zombies while Victor tried to move the propeller. When Morgan's voice came through the walkie-talkie, Charlie immediately reported their safety. Morgan, relieved, 
reminded them to keep their distance from the radioactive zombies and said he would arrive as soon as possible. Victor told Morgan not to rush over and instead find a vehicle to transport the propeller. Morgan, looking around, realized it was impossible to find a vehicle in his current location and sought help from Grace, a worker at the nuclear power station. However, Grace said she couldn't leave as the generator was still running. She suggested checking the nuclear plant's employee dormitory a few miles to the east for a vehicle. Meanwhile, Victor, dragging the propeller, slowly retreated. With zombies approaching from all around, they came up with a temporary solution. Just as Victor pulled the propeller into a yellow tarp, Charlie quickly tightened the rope, creating a makeshift large open-air tent, temporarily keeping the zombies outside. But this was only a temporary measure, and they prayed Morgan would arrive soon. Morgan quickly found a vehicle at the employee dormitory but without the keys. He had to search inside the houses. On the other side, Alicia arrives at the children's residence, where they still use a large number of zombies as shields. To get through, she had to clear a path. Alicia quickly fought her way into the zombie horde. The children's strategy had some merit, but Alicia was not a weak woman. As long as the zombies didn't swarm her, she could clear all of them from the area. Alicia walked along the cleared path for a while. Looking at the familiar zombies in front of her means she's back in the same place. Just as she was about to deal with it, she heard a noise behind her, it was the young boy Dylan, who told her she was going in the wrong direction and led her to a fenced area. The children had done a good job with protection. Alicia met Annie again, who said she just wanted to help, but Annie refused unequivocally, having been told countless times that they didn't need help and that she shouldn't come. The children had built their house on the water with only one pathway leading to it. Alicia warned Annie that nuclear radiation was soon approaching and that it was very unsafe to stay there. They would only watch each other die. The other children actually wanted to go with Alicia, longing for an adult to lean on. But Annie was very determined and insisted that she would protect them. And Annie said we're not leaving and you're not leaving either. She blamed Alicia for knocking down the zombies that were protecting them saying they had to wait until they cleared the bodies from the forest. If Alicia missed her flight back because of this, it was not their fault. Thus, Alicia was left behind. She spoke with Morgan and learned about Victor's situation. Morgan told her she needed to bring the children to the truck stop to leave together. Alicia expressed her helplessness, saying she had already tried her best. Morgan was silent for a long time, but then he inadvertently touched the keys to the car and said that everything happens for a reason. Then, he saw a zombie outside the window and felt as if he saw himself in it. He tells Alicia, We're gonna do what we came here to do. Victor and Charlie in the tent know their makeshift barrier won't last much longer and are preparing to face the zombies directly. Victor comforted Charlie, and everyone was trying to make amends for their past mistakes, including the once selfish Victor. Just then, the sound of a car attracted the zombies. Victor quickly took out his gun, just in case. But soon, blood splattered on the tent, and the people outside seemingly unaware of the zombies' radiation. In just 30 seconds, there was silence outside. Victor stepped out to see all the zombies down and a man in a protective suit, obviously Morgan, standing amidst them. Victor and Charlie breathed a sigh of relief. Meanwhile, the generator cooling the reactor was overwhelmed and started emitting smoke. Grace can't do anything now. All her efforts are in vain. Morgan got on the walkie-talkie and asked Grace if the generator was working. Grace said the generator had burned out. Morgan grasped the gravity of the situation when Grace told him they had at most 12 hours before the reactor melted down, leaving them little time to repair the plane. But Grace promised to try fixing the generator to buy them time and meet them at the truck stop afterward. Morgan knew she was just saying this and didn't intend to leave alive. Morgan then gave Victor the map and instructed him to bring the propeller to the truck stop. He couldn't let a woman face everything alone. Soon, Morgan found Grace. Despite the increased risk of radiation, he came anyway. Everyone deserved to be saved. I'm not gonna let you act like you are. In a post-apocalyptic world, a nuclear power plant is on the brink of explosion, threatening to irradiate everyone in the vicinity, turning them into zombies. Morgan and his group have only 12 hours left to repair their airplane. Alicia finds the children's residence and tries to persuade them to leave with her on the plane. However, Annie doesn't trust anyone's help and insists they can avoid the radiation while searching for them. Alicia kills the zombies they had set up forcing Annie and Max to relocate to the forest to reset their defenses. Suddenly, a zombie breaks free from its restraints, alarming Annie. More zombies escape, forcing Annie and Max to quickly retreat. Hearing their distress call over the radio, Alicia rushes to help. There's a large group of zombies behind Annie, and the kids rush to let them in. However, 
They wonder if the wooden door can withstand the zombie assault. The children, overwhelmed by the situation, realize the door won't hold for long. The kids are all a little freaked out at this point. Alicia, standing at the forefront, asks about their ammunition. Frustrated, Max tells her that their guns are empty and just for show. Alicia takes charge, asking for her weapons back to hold off the zombies. Annie still doesn't trust Alicia, but Max makes her believe in Alicia's abilities because he saw Alicia fight at the crash site. If she wants to do something to them, there's no one here to stop her. As Annie hesitated, the zombies had already forced a gap in the door. Reluctantly, Annie handed the weapons back to Alicia. Several zombies squeezed through the gap. Alicia walked onto a narrow bridge, turned to them, and said, quickly find a way out. I'll buy you time. The children, no longer hesitating, began to retreat. Alicia, armed again, was like a goddess of war, her movements efficient and deadly, almost every strike fatal. She actively ran towards the door, trying to buy as much time as possible for the children's escape. Longtime fans knew how long the weapon in Alicia's hands had been with her. She wielded it skillfully, a simple slash or stab easily penetrating the zombies' skulls. After dealing with a few zombies, Alicia quickly asked Annie if they had left. Max said they needed more time. Alicia turned back to the door as more zombies began to enter. By then, the children had almost reached the shore using the rope. Alicia continued to hold off the zombies, having lost count of how many she had killed. Just as she had killed one zombie, another pounced on her, knocking her to the ground. Alicia, exerting all her strength, pushed the zombie away, the barrel of her gun piercing the zombie's skull. When she pulled it out, blood splattered on her face. Fortunately, the wooden door held, giving her a moment to breathe. Looking at the zombie, Alicia felt something was amiss. The zombie's chest bore a small cylinder, indicating it was a radiation-infected zombie. A moment of panic flashed through Alicia's mind, but there was no time for fear. She realized they couldn't keep this up and had to lead the zombies away. Alicia told Annie, you can't protect them here. Take them to the truck stop and leave. That's the best protection for them. Annie, abandoning her stubbornness, led them to the truck stop. Then Alicia began knocking on the wood, intending to attract the zombies elsewhere. In the evening, Victor and Charlie also arrived at the truck stop with a propeller. Soon after, the group of children arrived there by car. Luciana introduced the children to Victor and Charlie. When asked where Alicia was, Annie replied that they didn't know. Meanwhile, Alicia arrived at a body of water. She wanted to clean the blood off her face, feeling panicked about the possibility of being irradiated. Just then, Morgan called her over the radio, asking if she was okay. Alicia almost lost control of her emotions, but as the strong warrior she is, she composed herself and told him she was fine. Helping others is difficult, she thought. Sometimes even protecting oneself is a challenge. Morgan and Alicia agreed on a meeting place. At that moment, the sound of the air raid siren filled the air, signaling that the nuclear reactor was close to failure. The end of the siren's sound would mark the explosion and spread of radiation. The next day, a figure was showering, and it was Alicia, who had found Morgan. This was a method suggested by Grace to remove radiation from the body. The alarm from the nuclear power plant continued. Grace said they should leave soon as the plant could explode at any moment. She returned the clean weapons to Alicia, expressing uncertainty about Alicia's safety without proper testing equipment. Just then, zombies, which they thought they had evaded, appeared at the end of the road. Morgan couldn't help but curse. Luciana and others were nearby, clearing the runway for the final takeoff, and they couldn't let the zombies affect the plane's departure. Morgan said they would find a way to lead the zombies away. Luciana mentioned that the plane still needed some time to be ready. However, there was another problem. John and Dwight, who had gone to look for Dwight's wife, were out of contact. Morgan couldn't worry about that now. They had to lead the zombies away. The car moved slowly forward with the zombies. With Grace's plan to lead them towards the nuclear power station, they stopped the car by the roadside. Using the sound of the air raid siren to attract the zombies, they lay down and waited for the zombies to move forward. Morgan said they would return once the zombies reached the hill ahead. At that moment, Alicia realized something was wrong. They then noticed the air raid siren had stopped, followed by a huge explosion. The nuclear reactor had finally exploded. A zombie lunged at the car window. Zombies in front were drawn by the noise and started moving towards the car. They had no choice but to leave quickly. However, in her panic, Grace crashed the car into another vehicle nearby and got it stuck. They had to abandon the car and run. Morgan quickly contacted Luciana, telling her to get the plane ready as they were on their way. But they were being followed by a group of zombies. In this zombie-infested area, 
A nuclear power plant had exploded. They had to leave before the radioactive dust spread further. Their only hope of escape was the recently repaired airplane. Everyone worked together to clear the runway. Victor and Althea were conducting the final checks on the plane, ready to take off as soon as everyone was assembled. However, John, who had gone out to help Dwight find his wife, was now unreachable, causing anxiety for both of them. They had been rushing back since hearing the air raid siren. They've managed to find a working car, but it's broken down on the road. Dwight explained that after several years of the apocalypse, much of the gasoline had deteriorated. Stepping out of the car, they saw the black mushroom cloud, instantly realizing what had happened. Naomi's voice came through the radio, relieved to contact John. She urged him to return quickly as almost everything was ready for takeoff. John said they might not make it. Their car had broken down. Naomi immediately asked their location to come and get them. John replied it was too far and they would try to return as soon as possible. However, he asked her to promise one thing, whether he made it back or not. She must persuade everyone to leave on the plane. Although there are a thousand reluctance John still adjusted his emotions. Deep down, he loved Naomi dearly. After a long struggle, he said his goodbyes. Naomi, helpless, promised John she would leave on the plane. John's last words were I love you. Knowing he wouldn't make it back, Dwight felt very sorry, as John had gone out to help him find his wife. Just then, John spotted something. The wind direction near the plane started changing, indicating that the radiation was spreading towards them. Time was running out. Morgan's voice came through the radio, urging everyone to board the plane. When Luciana asked where Morgan was, he replied he was very close to them. Just as he finished speaking, they saw Morgan and Alicia running out of the forest. Upon learning that John hadn't arrived yet, Morgan said they would wait for John and Dwight until it was absolutely necessary to leave. However, they needed help as a horde of zombies followed them out of the woods. Their only option now was to hold off the zombies as long as possible to allow the plane to take off. Victor and Althea were responsible for piloting the plane and were currently activating its various functions. They were immensely tense, as the plane had not been officially started since its repair. The propeller began to slowly rotate, giving Victor a sigh of relief. At this moment, Morgan and the others were still hoping to delay a bit longer, waiting to see if John and his party could make it back in time. Victor and Althea encouraged each other, knowing the lives of everyone depended on their hands. The zombies were getting closer to the plane, and they couldn't be dealt with in a short time. Althea informed Morgan via radio that they couldn't delay any longer, or else they wouldn't have enough fuel to cross the mountain range. Is everyone ready? They all raised their guns. Morgan was about to give the order to fire at the zombies to buy time for John to arrive. But Naomi said, let's go. I promised him not to let everyone miss the plane because of him. Seeing the zombies approaching, Morgan knew what choice to make. He instructed everyone to quickly board the plane. He told Victor over the radio to take off as soon as he gave the signal. The group hurried to the door of the plane. And at that moment, the sound of a car horn came from behind the zombie horde. A car broke through the zombies, it was John and Dwight, who had finally found a vehicle and made it. Naomi finally breathed a sigh of relief. They made it onto the plane just in time. As the zombies nearly reached the tail of the plane, Morgan gave the command to depart. And Althea and Victor took a deep breath and started the plane. The plane sped up. With only a few zombies clinging on persistently, the plane moved along the runway. Victor and Althea were extremely nervous. Without a smooth takeoff, everything was uncertain. The radioactive dust was also reaching them at the same time. Althea said they needed to lighten the load to take off. Morgan and John quickly dealt with two zombies and threw the netted ropes down. The effect was immediate, and the plane successfully lifted off the ground. Victor and Althea tensed up for the next big challenge, escaping the radioactive dust cloud in the air. Following Victor's experience, they steered the plane to the right, successfully avoiding the dust, and then broke through the fog to ascend higher. Everyone on the plane had never ridden such a thrilling vehicle in their lives. Fortunately, the plane began to stabilize, giving them hope. Relieved smiles appeared on everyone's faces. Dwight missed his wife. Morgan was quietly watching his old mate. The children were convinced that this would be an experience they would never forget. John and Naomi were grateful to be reunited. Victor began comforting Althea, suggesting she look at the beautiful scenery outside the window to relax. The rainbow after the storm was so beautiful. Althea, so strong throughout the mission, had almost suffocated. Now, she finally relaxed a bit. The plane continued towards home. In real life, we should also be positive and optimistic. Even if you are in a low point, persisting and flying past it leads to beautiful scenery. Let's encourage each other.
but there was still the significant challenge of landing. Those familiar with planes know that landing requires landmarks for guidance, to provide guidance for the plane. Sarah came to the jeans factory again, coincidentally meeting Logan, who was about to leave. In fact, Logan didn't care about the factory at all. He occupied it merely to look for something. Now, the factory was in complete disarray, indicating that whatever they were searching for wasn't there. They no longer needed the place. Sarah directly stated her purpose. Her friends had gone to a far place because of him and were now flying back. She needed his truck fleet to turn on their headlights to serve as a landmark for the plane. She warned him that if he stood by idly this time, he would regret it for life. But Logan didn't care at all. He had no intention of helping others. Searching the entire factory, Sarah only found three glow sticks, which were practically useless, just when they didn't know what to do. A car approached from a distance, they tensed up, as there were few good people in this post-apocalyptic world. The car drove straight towards them, but it turned out to be Daniel returning after finishing his task. Sarah let out the cat they had been keeping for Daniel. Daniel said he heard their conversation on the radio and had brought some useful items. He urged them to unload the goods before dark. Daniel had brought party lights, unexpectedly useful for the situation. Wendell, with limited mobility, was in charge of guarding the power source. The plane soon flew over the mountain range towards the landing site. The passengers on the plane were somewhat tired. Victor urgently called Sarah. She informed him that they were finishing up and advised them to watch the ground. Althea seemed to spot something a colorful ribbon of light. Victor excitedly told everyone to look. Meanwhile, Wendell, guarding the power source, spotted a zombie emerging from the woods. He didn't raise an alarm, confident in handling a single zombie. Wendell calmly moved his wheelchair to the side of the zombies. Then he turned the wheelchair and turned on the switch behind him. But unfortunately, another zombie approached from the front. Wendell struggled to pull out his shotgun, but it was too late. The zombie tore the power line, plunging the runway into darkness. Althea instantly realized something was wrong, with fuel running low. Their only option was to land. Victor's anxious voice came through the radio. Wendell also pulled the trigger and killed the zombies with one shot. Sarah and Daniel realized something was wrong. Wendell made his decision at this point, and he flung himself down in a flash. Victor is still repeatedly asking if anyone has received the message. Wendell said over the radio to Sarah that if he didn't survive, her beer was the worst he'd ever tasted, but he still loved her. Sarah, not knowing what happened, understood that Wendell was saying his last words. Wendell watched the plane nearing the ground, knowing he might get crushed by it, but still struggled to crawl towards the generator. Althea had no choice but to prepare for an emergency landing without guidance. Akin to landing blindfolded, she alerted everyone to brace themselves for the imminent landing. Tension rose again among the passengers. Having escaped radiation, they now faced the possibility of dying in a crash. In the final moments, Wendell managed to restore the power, with the plane only about 10 meters from the ground. This gave Victor and Althea a brief window to react. The plane began to shake violently upon touching down, leaving everyone uncertain about a safe landing. Fortunately, the plane eventually stabilized, prompting a sigh of relief from even Morgan. Wendell was tearfully emotional, and Victor laughed heartily, feeling this was the greatest thing he had ever done. The first words from Morgan and others after disembarking were, we're still alive. Although not separated for long, the life and death experiences made them cherish their time together even more. After disembarking from the plane, everyone had a sense of having narrowly escaped disaster. They greeted Daniel and others, embracing warmly in relief and joy. Althea and Daniel, being old acquaintances, shared a warm reunion. Everyone swore never to board that plane again. The children were also ready to start their lives anew. Sarah's cheerfulness broke the children's inhibitions. Daniel stayed until the end and Alicia rushed to hug him first. This is the team that was formed from the beginning, and they hugged each other tightly, expressing their thoughts of each other. Having gone through so much, their reunion was especially meaningful. Daniel then noticed Dwight next to him. Dwight, a loner himself, simply said hello. Charlie hugged Daniel as soon as he got off the plane. For Daniel, who had lost his daughter, Charlie's presence brought some color back into his world, filling the void of his lost daughter. He may have taken Charlie as his daughter, so he came back again, and inadvertently did everyone a big favor. Charlie naturally felt the paternal warmth from Daniel and saw him as a father figure, filling her own need for paternal affection. Seeing Victor approach, Daniel admitted he had been wrong about him, his opinion entirely changed by Victor's actions. Everyone was safe and sound, and there was nothing more joyous than that. At that moment, Morgan's radio crackled to life with a woman's voice. Morgan began to ask, Who are you? 
The woman replied, was that your plane flying over? After their experience with Logan, Morgan became cautious. The woman explained, we've heard your radio broadcasts before and seen your boxes on the roadside. We never dared to believe it. But now, seeing your plane, we do. We need your help. Then the woman's voice disappeared. A car approached from the distance and drove up to where Morgan and the others were. They immediately became alert. The person who got out of the car was Logan. Morgan and the others were seeing Logan for the first time. The man who had deceived them into going to the mountains, nearly costing them their lives. Morgan asked, what are you doing here? Logan replied, if you want to help the woman on the radio, you should listen to me. I have a proposal. They were not in a forgiving mood towards the man who had deceived them. Logan continued, I had a reason for deceiving you into going to the other side of the mountain range. Haven't you noticed the unprecedented hurricanes and the increasingly broken world? People can't get where they want to go anymore because the petrol is starting to go bad. Logan mentioned that Clayton, the former owner of the factory, had realized this problem. He had arranged for some people to maintain some resources. With the addresses recorded in his journal, I thought the journal was in the factory, which is why I deceived you away. But despite turning the factory upside down, I couldn't find it. The journal should still be in your possession, right? Luciana candidly admitted that it was still with her. Logan then said, give me the journal and I can take you there. Luciana and Victor questioned Logan, asking, how do we know this isn't a trap? Why didn't you bring your guards to steal the journal? Logan responded, saying, if they knew I came to you, they would kill all of us. The gasoline is deteriorating fast. If you want to help others, are you planning to walk? We can work together to find resources. In this post-apocalyptic world, there was a team dedicated to helping others against all odds. They called out daily over the radio for those in need of help. However, survivors were extremely wary and didn't trust that anyone would genuinely offer assistance. In the end, the first survivor, Logan, asks for their help, but tricks them into going deeper into the mountains, nearly killing them. Logan then occupied their home base. After Morgan's team escaped the radiation and flew back, Logan told them the gasoline was deteriorating and proposed a partnership to find the gasoline left by Clayton. After witnessing the miracle of their airplane that night, countless survivors realized there was indeed a team genuinely helping others. From then on, more and more people began to seek their help over the radio. Logan was right about one thing. The gasoline was indeed deteriorating. But after his deception, they could no longer trust him. They left Logan on the roadside with some supplies. Following the addresses in Clayton's journal, they indeed found an oil field with two of Clayton's partners still producing oil. Knowing that Morgan and his team were continuing Clayton's mission, they supported them unconditionally. Sarah and Wendell took charge of driving the tanker, transporting gasoline every few weeks. An armored vehicle constantly guarded the tanker for safety. With the support of gasoline, Morgan's convoy gradually expanded, dividing into groups to help others every day. Morgan's conviction brought about a change in the team, embodying what truly matters in a post-apocalyptic world. Alicia also started learning stick fighting for Morgan. Since Alicia killed that radioactive zombie, she's never killed a zombie again. Victor carried Alicia's signature weapon for her protection. The entire team moved from place to place, yet to find a suitable settlement. Naomi took on a managerial role within the convoy. It's worth mentioning Daniel, the smartest among them. Daniel said on camera that people like Logan should be shot as soon as he opens his mouth and not be allowed to say a word more. Otherwise there will be a lot of trouble in the future. As they helped others, the team also welcomed new members. Growing in size, they sat around a campfire, eating and laughing, creating an atmosphere reminiscent of the time before the apocalypse. All these moments were recorded by the camera. Each person conveyed a message through the camera, if you are in trouble, contact us anytime. Under Morgan's leadership, this team became a beautiful sight in the post-apocalyptic world. Althea had created a documentary from their videos of helping others, and Morgan placed the tapes at every truck stop. Coincidentally, a man had just finished watching this documentary. He ate some food from the boxes and noticed the radio next to the TV, which had a note saying to contact Channel 4 if in trouble. Wes, after much hesitation, only took the radio without intending to contact Morgan's team. In this post-apocalyptic world, trusting others was considered foolish. Wes found gasoline in the box and headed straight to his motorcycle, intending to fill it up and leave. Just then, two vehicles approached on the road, realizing something was amiss. Wes knew it was too late to leave. The people who got out were Logan and his group. Wes's first words were that he didn't want any trouble. Logan replied he didn't either, then threw a pair of shoes in front of Wes, saying, you made me walk 200 kilometers. 
Logan accused them of taking away the gasoline and not being able to enjoy the results of the roads he and Clayton had cleared. Wes looked confusedly at Logan. Logan's guards then took all of Wes's belongings, even siphoning the gasoline he had just added to his motorcycle. Logan demanded the location of the oil field, saying Wes could leave if he told him. Wes replied he didn't know what Logan was talking about. Realizing Wes wasn't part of Morgan's team, Logan prepared to leave with Wes's supplies, instructing his men to ensure Wes couldn't follow them. The woman beside Logan, understanding his intent, lifted her automatic rifle. Wes initially thought they were about to execute him, but instead, the woman shot and damaged the tires of his motorcycle. Wes, heartbroken over his damaged vehicle, was about to speak when his car endured a barrage of bullets for several seconds, leaving it completely destroyed. Before leaving, Logan tossed the radio to Wes, suggesting he could ask Morgan's team for help and mockingly added to tell Morgan they had endless bullets. Wes could only watch helplessly as they drove away. Elsewhere, Alicia and Victor were wandering outside. Alicia was intrigued by graffiti she saw on many trees, which read, if you're seeing this, it means you're still alive. Alicia would very much like to meet the person who drew these. These messages gave her an unexplained sense of encouragement. While she was observing them, a zombie appeared behind her. Alicia, somewhat at a loss, called out for Victor but received no response. Ever since developing a fear, Alicia had been apprehensive about killing zombies. Just as the zombie pounced on her, Alicia hesitated to kill it and could only use her hands to hold off its neck. Fortunately, Victor arrived just in time to eliminate the zombie. Victor easily dispatched a few more zombies that appeared. Alicia was unsure how to overcome her fear. Back in the car, Victor mentioned their gasoline was running low and suggested returning to the convoy. However, Alicia was still keen on finding the person who made the graffiti, hoping it might help her break through her mental barrier. At that moment, a man's voice came through the radio. Alicia responded. The man. Hearing her voice, directly called out Alicia's name. Victor guessed he must have seen their documentary. The man introduced himself as Wes and asked for a ride home. After a while, Victor and Alicia reached the rescue site. Wes, having little faith in people who do good deeds while publicizing them, had only sought their help out of desperation. All he wants is for Victor to take him home, where his brother is waiting for him. On the way, Wes learned about Alicia's search for the graffiti artist. He advised her that finding the person might not change anything. As some things were just imagination, they arrived at a police station where Wes thanked them for the ride and went inside to greet his brother. Victor and Alicia stayed outside to help move the motorcycle, but soon gunshots were heard from inside. A man with a gunshot wound to his abdomen ran out, followed by Wes with a gun. Victor quickly intervened to stop Wes's pursuit. The wounded man had already driven off in their car, breaking through the barrier. Wes frantically chased after the car, firing shots, but could only watch as the man drove away. The gunshots quickly attracted zombies. The nearby zombies were quickly attracted by the commotion. Wes took out a weapon backpack from the police station, but surprisingly, the gun in his hand failed to kill any zombies even after several shots. Alicia reminded them that they were anti-riot weapons with limited lethality. Victor fired his first shot, only to realize it was tear gas. More zombies gathered around, forcing them to retreat into the police station. Victor was choking on tear gas and had tears streaming down his face but he forced himself to kill the zombies as well. They took shelter inside the police station, where Alicia helped Victor clear his eyes, allowing him to see a bit more clearly. Victor and Alicia realized they had been deceived by Wes. This was not his home. Wes had come here to kill that man. Wes explained that the man had stolen his stuff, and he needed to get it back. Killing him would be ideal. He admitted he did have a brother, but he had died at the onset of the apocalypse. Victor, lying in bed, said they needed to find the injured man quickly, or he would bleed to death. Wes looked at them in disbelief. It was the other man who had stolen from him first. But Alicia and Victor, influenced by Morgan, didn't care about these issues. They only wanted to help others. However, the exit was heavily surrounded by zombies. Wes mockingly said to Alicia, you can't even kill a single zombie, let alone a group, clearly. Wes thought Alicia was a weak and incapable woman, with no other choice. Alicia used the radio to call Morgan, knowing it was risky to reveal their location over the radio, as Logan could be listening. She explained the urgency, a man had been shot and needed help, and they were trapped by zombies. She hoped for a rescue and told Morgan the direction the man had driven off in. Althea and Morgan immediately followed the road in search of the injured man, but not far along, they encountered a roadblock set up by Logan and his group who had overheard the radio conversation. Logan deliberately blocked the road to prevent their rescue. 
demanding Morgan reveal the location of the oil field, or else let the injured man slowly bleed to death. Logan and his people stated they were in no hurry, but the injured man might not survive until rescue arrived. Morgan tried to negotiate with them, hoping to reason with them to let them pass. Morgan asked Logan what he needed the oil field for. Logan replied that it was none of their business. He believed what he was doing was more important and would help more people in the future, though his methods were something they wouldn't like. Morgan was aware that the injured man couldn't wait much longer. However, he also understood that although he didn't know Logan's exact plans, allowing him access to the oil field would put many more people at risk. Morgan decided to look for another way. Logan's next words deeply angered Morgan. Logan said that helping others wouldn't lessen Morgan's guilt for not being able to save his wife and son. Clearly, Logan and his people had watched their documentary. Morgan's wife and son were his most sensitive subjects. And in the past, Morgan wouldn't have hesitated to act against anyone who mentioned them. Fortunately, Morgan restrained himself and did not react violently. Althea witnessed Morgan's fury for the first time. Meanwhile, Inside the police station, Wes told Alicia that the post-apocalyptic world was just like that. People are inherently selfish. If I don't kill him, someone else will. That's just how society is now, he said. However, Alicia countered, we can choose not to be like that and try to help others. At that moment, Morgan informed Alicia over the radio that they were being held up by Logan and couldn't reach the injured man. Alicia gathered usable weapons from the police station, preparing to break out with Victor, she took her weapon and got ready to fight. Victor's eyes are still a blur. Seeing Alicia's determination, Wes offered to help. He grabbed a weapon, climbed over the wall of the sports field, and began shooting zombies from the outside. Fortunately, there were enough weapons in the bag to eliminate all the zombies. It was just a matter of time. Only one zombie was left at the door. Alicia tried to adjust her mindset but the shadows of her past experiences lingered in her mind. Victor stepped in to take down the zombie for her. Victor's vision was too impaired to see the distance seen clearly. The last two zombies at the door were eliminated by Wes, who had arrived just in time. They soon found the car driven by the man on the side of the road. On the distant highway was the man, staggering unsteadily. Evidently, they were too late. The man had already turned into a zombie. Alicia informed Morgan of this situation. Wes didn't care about the man's fate. He was only concerned about whether his belongings were still there. Approaching the man from behind, Wes frowned when the man turned around. The man threw a backpack at Wes and then tackled him to the ground, clutching Wes's neck fiercely. In desperation, Wes grabbed a small knife from the ground and stabbed the man in the abdomen again. The man, until his death, couldn't believe that Wes was chasing him just for a manuscript. The man's last words were a compliment on the writing before he died. Wes threw the manuscript aside and finished the man off with the knife. Alicia questions Wes's behavior, asking him if he killed for a manuscript. Wes remarked, You made me act with kindness just now. Maybe I really shouldn't have contacted you. This world doesn't need right or wrong. Wes walked away, leaving the manuscript behind. Alicia asked if he didn't want his manuscript. Wes replied that since the man died for it, it should stay with him. Alicia opened the manuscript that had caused a life to be lost. It was apparently written by Wes for his brother, which explained why he valued it so much. In it, Alicia found the same phrase that was on the trees. If you see it, it proves you're still alive. Wes was the person she had been looking for all along. Indeed, they found paint in Wes's motorcycle. Alicia tried her hand at graffiti on a tree, but modified the words. As long as you're alive, there's hope for anyone. After this incident, Alicia's mental block was lifted, and she no longer had a shadow over killing zombies. The warrior goddess had fully returned. Two years after the outbreak of a zombie virus, the question remains, where can one find a stable home? Morgan's convoy's been moved I don't know how many times. After parking, they start building defenses, shaping the convoy into a circular bastion around their vital tanker truck. Crucial in a world where usable gasoline is increasingly scarce. As noon nears, Naomi is ready to lead another move, constantly searching for the ideal settlement. Despite the weariness from relentless relocation, she remains convinced that their current spot is unsuitable for living. At this moment, Dwight approached. Under Daniel's skilled guidance, Dwight had transformed his appearance, symbolizing his farewell to his former, ruthlessly violent self. Dwight said they couldn't move for the time being, but when he did a head count, he realized that one person was missing. Naomi is surprised, having tallied everyone the previous night. Turns out, last evening, a praying churchgoer heard a knock at the door. The man was wearing a suit and carrying a rifle. His forceful opening of the door knocked down the zombies. 
He was no stranger to such situations. He stepped into the yard and realized the main gate had been opened, allowing zombies to enter. After he closed the gate, there was another sound from the yard. Three zombies are by a car, and someone has apparently run and hidden inside. Without hesitation, the man confronted the zombies with his bayonet. He easily overpowered the zombies. Unexpectedly, he was tackled to the ground by another zombie from behind, while he was struggling to hold on. The car door opened forcefully and knocked the zombies away. Taking advantage, he shot and finished off the zombie. Afterwards, the man lay on the ground, taking a deep breath of relief. The person in the car turned out to be Charlie, who had run away from the convoy. At this time Charlie looks a bit of a mess, but fortunately the man is not a bad person to take Charlie in. The man's name was Jacob, a pastor. Early the next morning Jacob was at the fence killing zombies. Charlie offered to help, but in Jacob's eyes, she was just a little girl. Yet unexpectedly, Charlie exhibited remarkable calmness and skill. As a pastor, Jacob still maintained his habit of daily prayer in the church. Just then, the eternal flame symbolizing religious faith began to flicker, it was their last battery. Jacob could only tell Charlie that he needed to go out to find batteries, as the fire couldn't be allowed to go out. But Charlie stopped him. She felt she could help Jacob and contacted Naomi via walkie-talkie. Naomi, upon receiving the message, finally breathed a sigh of relief. She blamed herself for not counting everyone properly the previous night, leading to Charlie being left behind. Charlie said it wasn't her fault. She wasn't left behind but had run away on her own. Naomi was puzzled. Charlie explained that she used to wander with the convoy and just wanted to find a place to settle down. She had looked for several suitable places the previous night but found none. However, she felt she had found a place that could be home and invited Naomi to come and see. Bringing some batteries, Jacob, realizing there was movement outside, went out and eliminated another zombie. Charlie was puzzled about where the zombies were coming from. Jacob just said there must be a gap in the fence you go in first I'll check the fence. Looking at the zombie, Jacob sighed. Instead of checking the fence, he went to the backyard. There, he found a breach in the house's door, with a zombie trying to crawl out. Jacob quickly ran up, dragged the zombie out, and killed it with his weapon. Then he fixed the hole with a wooden board and reinforced the glass door. There were countless zombies inside the house. Soon, the battery issue was resolved. Naomi and John arrived in an armored vehicle. Jacob expressed his gratitude. Naomi said they needed to return to the convoy. However, Charlie insisted on staying and took Naomi outside to reinforce the wall. Charlie wanted Naomi to bring her convoy to settle here, but Naomi expressed concerns that the place was not big enough and lacked a water source. Meanwhile, in another part of the convoy, Dwight and Sarah were having a heartfelt conversation on the roof. Suddenly, they noticed something moving in the distance. Dwight used binoculars to get a closer look and saw that it was Logan's three cars. Naomi and John urged Charlie to leave quickly, but Charlie insisted. You all go. I'm staying. Just as Naomi was feeling helpless, Sarah's voice came through the walkie-talkie, saying, Logan has found me. Naomi realized the gravity of the situation. Sarah said, I've already instructed everyone to meet at the next rendezvous point, but we need the armored vehicle to protect the fuel truck. Hurry back. As they were preparing to leave, the sound of zombies could be heard outside. The door of the building had been shattered. When they opened the church's main door, they were stunned to see it swarming with zombies and quickly closed it again. Jacob no longer hid the truth, revealing that these zombies were not from outside the fence but were once members of his church congregation. He explained that when they were running low on supplies, he went out to find food, only to return to find them all turned into zombies. The convoy was in dire need of support. John surveyed the surroundings and came up with a plan. He's going to use the ladder to get to the armored car. Below them were zombies, and a fall would mean certain doom. As soon as they reached the top of the vehicle, zombies began to swarm around them. They had to cross several vehicles to get to the armored vehicle. Moving carefully one step at a time, John laid out the ladder and decided to test the route himself. Although the ladder was shaky, he successfully made it to the opposite vehicle. Naomi also got on the ladder and started to walk to the other side. They had safely passed the first obstacle. On the other side, Logan and his people were closely following the tanker, their target being the gasoline in the tanker. Sarah could only urge Naomi to come for support quickly. Naomi replied that they were trying their best. They continued to pave their way using the ladder. In this process, there was no room for error, as any mistake would turn them into food for the zombies. Charlie and Jacob watched nervously. Naomi, with John's assistance, first moved to another vehicle. By the time it was John's turn to walk, 
The zombies were almost able to touch his feet. John carefully stepped on the ladder and fell on it, but he was able to stabilize himself. They fired several shots and killed the nearest zombies before slowly moving to the roof of the car. The next part was the final stretch. The ladder was directly placed on top of the wall. Naomi had just started climbing when the fence began to collapse, nearly dropping her into the midst of the zombies. Now they were in a very awkward situation. The ladder had fallen, and the area around the vehicle was nearly all zombies. They definitely couldn't leave right away. Sarah and her group could only rely on themselves. Charlie and Jacob discussed and decided to abandon the church. John and Naomi can only kill a few zombies to vent their emotions. At that moment, a sound came from inside the church. Charlie opened the door and Jacob blew the horn. The zombies, attracted by the sound, began moving towards the church. And soon, the church was swarming with zombies. Charlie and Jacob quickly fled from the second floor. With no pressure on John's side, he easily took out two zombies. He dismantled the luggage rack from a car, ran to the front door, and secured it shut. Jacob also decided to join them and packed up his things to leave. Meanwhile, Sarah's fuel truck was still being pursued. Sarah reluctantly announced that the truck was running out of fuel. Dwight doesn't understand how they can run out of gas when they're driving a tanker. Sarah said that this is not a water pipe. The tank is not connected to the fuel tank. Soon, the vehicle stopped under a flyover. Dwight also drew his gun, ready for a fight. Three vehicles stopped beside them, merely Logan's subordinates. Logan himself was not there. Sarah declared that they would not leave the truck, even if it meant dying with it. As Sarah and Dwight prepared to confront the attack, the three vehicles started and left. Sarah and Dwight were puzzled, but then Sarah saw the armored vehicle in the rearview mirror. It turned out that the armored vehicle had scared them off. Sarah let out a long sigh of relief. John was glad to get rid of Logan and the others. Dwight said they chased us, burned a lot of petrol, and then turned around and left. Which, knowing Logan, is not normal. The situation was exactly as Dwight had suspected. The person who had just been pursuing them was informing Logan that their armored vehicle was far away and they were safe. Logan had deduced the location of the oil fields from Althea's documentary. This was his plan. At that moment, Logan had arrived at the location of the oil fields, hidden within a quarry. Let's talk about Logan's past. Back in the day, Logan and Clayton teamed up to create a trucking organization, actively helping survivors in the post-apocalyptic world. Logan was the brainchild behind their motto, plastered on their crates, take what you need, leave what you don't. One day, while Logan's out dropping off these boxes, he gets this distress call over the radio. It's a woman's voice, panicked, saying she's at a truck stop 65 miles away and zombies are on her tail. Logan's like, don't freak out, my buddy Clayton's on that road. He'll be there in a flash to back you up, but he can't get any response from Clayton. Little does Logan know, at that very moment, Clayton's truck's been hijacked by Sarah and her brother, so no rescue message gets through. Logan's got no choice but to tell the lady to lock up tight and that he's coming to save her. As he drove, the woman's cries for help became more and more urgent. Logan had to speed up the car and reassure the woman to hang on, but just as he's passing the 55-mile marker, his fuel gauge hits empty. He's forced to stop and, with the situation getting critical over the radio, Logan starts hoofing it on foot. Where are you? Almost there! He's only seven miles from the truck stop, so he books it, running like mad until he hits the 61 mile mark. Logan! Ten minutes later, Logan finally reaches the truck stop. The doors are wide open, no one inside. Then Logan saw that the woman had become food for the zombies. Logan, heartbroken, fires off four shots to put down the zombies, then collapses outside, devastated, feeling helpless and questioning himself after witnessing her death. Logan looks up to see five strangers on horseback approaching. They get to him, and the woman leading them, Virginia, dismounts and just says sorry. They heard it all go down over the radio. Logan's like, what do you need? Virginia says she's just there to help. They've been watching him, listening to his broadcasts. Logan has a moment of doubt. She tells him they share the same dream of helping others. Only their vision is bigger. They could build a better future together. From that moment, Logan changes. He stops helping strangers and focuses on seizing the oil fields for Morgan. But deep down, Logan's still a good guy. Even with his vast array of weapons, he would not let his men hurt anyone. In a world where electricity is a rare commodity, zombies, in a way, 
became like perpetual motion machines. This place is the oil field that Morgan and the others hold. Two boys picked out a little white mouse and hung it on the railing. Then, they released the hook that was secured on the ground. Drawn by the rat, the zombies started to shuffle forward. And just like that, a perpetual motion machine for extracting crude oil was born. Workers then opened the valves, transferring the stored crude into the refining tanks, heated to high temperatures for refining. And after settling in separation, they got usable gasoline. Luciana and Wendell, grubby and grimy, did this daily grind to keep the convoy powered up? Wendell's always griping, we're producing way too much, there's nowhere to store it all. And he's like, by my count, Sarah should be rolling in with the tanker tomorrow to pick up the oil. Wendell was getting a little tired of this place and said I wake up every morning with a pillow as dirty as a shroud. Then, they hear a truck approaching. At the door, they realize something's off. Wendell quickly radios Sarah to check if it's them, but gets no response. As the truck noise gets closer, they realize it might be strangers. Then, two vehicles smash right through the gate. Annie hurries her brothers back inside. Luciana and the others see who's stepped out. It's Logan and his squad. Logan recognizes Clayton's people and cuts to the chase. He's there to take over the oil fields. Meanwhile, Victor's off helping Alicia unwind. Alicia's taken a liking to graffiti, hoping Wes will see her work and believe there's still hope in this world. Just then, Alicia's radio crackles to life. A woman's desperate plea for help. The woman said she was at a truck stop marked 65 miles away, locked herself in a building because of zombies outside, and needed their help. Alicia immediately radios for help, hoping someone can rescue the woman, but Naomi says they're en route to the oil fields, suspecting Logan's crew might have discovered it. Daniel and Morgan are out of range, too far to communicate. So, Alicia and Victor have no choice but to drive there themselves. In these last days, those who have no voice are left on their knees and at the mercy of others. One of Logan's cronies, Doris, found Clayton's diary. Luciana was forced to kneel helplessly, seething with silent anger. Logan briefly skimmed through the diary but didn't find the oil refining method he was looking for, so he callously tossed the journal into the fire. Clayton's hard work and dedication, up in smoke because of Logan. Logan then asked if they wanted to spill the beans on how to refine oil. Luciana, already disgusted by his actions, flat out refused. Logan just laughed, expecting this response. Then he took out his walkie-talkie and started contacting the man who had chased Sarah to tell him to come over and start refining the oil. This was the source of Logan's confidence. The guy already knew how to refine oil. Blocked by crates on the highway and wanting to save time, the man decided to move them. When he tried to move the crate, the lid opened. Sarah, gun in hand, aimed at the man. And Dwight also took control of the two in the car. Turns out, Sarah had overheard the man asking Logan for directions over the radio, so Sarah and Naomi split up, with Sarah and Dwight heading here to intercept. The man, assuming they wouldn't shoot, was clearly taken aback by Sarah's forceful presence. Sarah, with her fiery temper, fired a warning shot and said, I've done a lot of unbearable bad stuff in my life, but one thing I can't get over is stealing Clayton's truck with Wendell, which led to his tragic death, killing you, though, won't weigh on my conscience. The man was intimidated by Sarah's aura and remained silent. Then the vehicle arrived at the quarry. Logan was expecting his own guy. But instead, it was Sarah and Dwight. Logan's crew tensed up immediately. Sarah and Dwight pointed their pistols at Logan. And the man who could refine oil was thrown into the road by Sarah. An infuriated Logan told Luciana that now she had to refine the oil. Just then, one of the perpetual motion zombies got its head blown off. It was sharpshooter John and Naomi arriving just in time. John said he fired the shot as a warning to prevent anyone from accidentally pulling the trigger. Logan's men are also a bit panicked. They've seen the documentary and they know that John's a good shot. But Logan doesn't panic. He knew the humanity of these people. Logan then took out his walkie-talkie and said to John, You guys spend every day helping others. You wouldn't shoot a living person. This is all just bluster. You alone can't kill all of us. John didn't kill anyone after all. Killing wasn't what Sarah and the others wanted to see. So, she lowered her gun and tried to reason with Logan. Our ask is simple, Sarah said. We're not here to kill anyone or take over the oil fields. Let's try to resolve this peacefully. Logan replied. Let's talk then. You stay and refine the oil and I'll let the kids go. Sarah agreed but insisted on one condition, a vehicle for the kids to join up with their convoy. The three kids wanted to stay together through thick and thin, but Luciana urged them to leave immediately. Reluctantly, the kids complied. A new zombie replaced the old one in the perpetual motion machine, and the refining process was brutally efficient. Logan seemed in a hurry. Sarah asked. 
Why don't you tell us what you need all this oil for? Logan didn't go into details but said they would use the resources to create a better home, not just help people one by one like they did. Actually, I should thank you, Sarah. You've helped me evolve. Sarah was a little confused. Logan explained, not long ago, I received a distress call from a woman on Clayton's route. Clayton didn't respond, and I went myself, but I was too late. I listened as the woman was torn apart by zombies, helpless to do anything. It was because Clayton wasn't there, because you stole his truck. The things I'm going to do will change this kind of situation for good. If you really want to help, don't stand in my way. All the good deeds you do can't make up for this. Sarah and Wendell felt even more guilty after hearing Logan's story. Naomi's voice came over the radio. You should leave. Zombies have started to appear above the oil fields. Meanwhile, Alicia and Victor were racing towards the truck stop, with the woman's increasingly frantic pleas for help coming through. When Alicia asked her name, the woman replied, I can't say my name. It wouldn't be safe. Are you really coming to save me? Obviously, it's hard to believe that anyone would come to your aid in a post-apocalyptic world. But, as fate would have it, Victor spread his hands in despair as their vehicle ran out of gas. Now they had to continue on foot. It seemed eerily similar to Logan's situation, a girl trapped at a truck stop 65 miles away. A rescue attempt thwarted by a vehicle breakdown, was history about to repeat itself? In the apocalypse, gasoline became a crucial resource that people desperately fought over. Last episode, Logan and his crew successfully took over the oil fields. Even though sharpshooter John held the high ground, he couldn't change much. At the end of the day, there was no irreconcilable conflict between the two sides, just different stances. So, there was no bloody conflict. Sarah, Luciana, and others voluntarily stayed to help with the oil refining, with the condition that the kids leave the area. During the refining process, Logan seemed in a hurry, urging his men to keep the fire blazing, sending thick smoke into the sky. Luciana warned Logan that the flames were too big and would attract zombies, but Logan didn't care. Sure enough, Naomi spotted a few zombies heading their way. By nightfall, more zombies lured by the fire started arriving, and John had to keep shooting to alleviate the pressure on the ground. Many zombies fell from the hill into the quarry, forcing both sides to temporarily unite against the zombies. At first, everyone managed to handle the zombies easily, but the huge flames were too conspicuous at night. Doris suggested to Luciana to put out the fire. But Luciana said it was impossible now due to the high temperature. Naomi then noticed a swarm of zombies atop the hill. As long as the fire burned, the zombies would keep coming. Zombies continually descended into the quarry. John was killing zombies diligently, but the gunfire attracted more than he could shoot down. Naomi told them there were too many zombies and urged everyone to evacuate. The whole quarry was in chaos. Dwight and others had reduced combat effectiveness as their weapons were confiscated. Wendell said they had to evacuate immediately. Dwight mentioned losing the oil fields meant they couldn't help others, but Wendell insisted survival was the priority. They quickly decided to escape in the tanker truck. Logan, unwilling to give up the hard-won oil fields, called for his men to help fix the perpetual motion machine. Zombies crawled towards Logan. He called Doris for help, but she turned and left. The fire grew larger, making evacuation urgent. Just as Sarah was about to leave in the vehicle, she saw Logan staggering through the smoke. After a fierce internal struggle, remembering how her actions had caused a good person's death before, she couldn't let it happen again. Sarah told Dwight she'd help Logan, and if she wasn't back in two minutes, they should leave without her. Wendell deeply understood Sarah's feelings. They felt responsible for Logan's transformation. Seeing Logan collapsed on the ground, Sarah didn't hesitate to rush into the smoke. On the other hand, Alicia and Victor were still rushing to save the woman at the truck stop. The woman said she wasn't sure how long the door would hold, and her radio was dying. Alicia advised her to turn on the generator at the truck stop and speak on the public channel to broadcast her location, as someone closer might hear her. Do you copy? Sarah managed to save Logan with great effort, but he was ungrateful. Logan believed they'd either suffocate or be eaten by zombies. He mocked them, asking if anyone would come to save them now. Anybody there? I need help. More people out there for you to save. But then the voice on the walkie-talkie said, My position is 65 kilometers from the truck stop. Hearing this, Logan became unsettled, as it reminded him of his painful past. Logan asked if there was a sunscreen advertisement on the wall. The door to the truck stop was barely holding at the moment. The woman, seeing the ad, asked how he knew about it, wondering if Alicia had told him. 
Sarah started to wonder if Logan knew this woman. Logan said sadly, I don't know her, it's just history repeating itself. Everything I'm doing now is to prevent such things from happening again. Do you think what you're doing is helping her? Giving this poor girl hope, but you can't fulfill it. Logan picks up the radio and says stranger you're on your own. The sooner you accept that the sooner you'll know what you have to do. Luciana and the others listened to their conversation in the vehicle. The girl said she couldn't kill all the zombies. There were too many. Logan revealed there was a gun under the counter. Left there previously, the girl found the gun. But her initial excitement turned to fear upon seeing only one bullet. Logan looked pained, probably reminded of the girl from his past. The girl also understood what Logan meant that the bullet was for herself. Watching the zombies go berserk outside, she thought it might be a dignified way out. Sarah fell silent. Luciana and the others were also silent. Logan was right no one could get there in time. Why give her false hope? Janice had a pistol to her head and she wanted to live but the door couldn't hold the zombies back. Suddenly, the zombies began to pour in. On the other side, Logan, hearing the zombies growling, knew the door had been breached. Janice knows that killing herself might not be necessary to watch herself get eaten by zombies. Everyone fell silent. The only sound being the zombies' growls over the radio, the image of what was about to happen played in their minds. Nearly all the zombies had made it into the room, facing death. No one is fearless. Janice decided to pull the trigger the moment a zombie touched her. No one made a sound. It was a brutal process, as if everyone was waiting for that gunshot. Logan's heart seemed to tremble for a moment, mourning the loss of a vibrant life. This was hard to accept for Luciana and others, who were used to helping people. Sarah was about to turn off the radio when several gunshots rang out. Logan was stunned. Everyone sensed a glimmer of hope, then heard a stranger's voice. Sarah quickly asked, Who are you? Janice, still holding the radio, was frozen in place. The man replied, My name is Wes. I heard Alicia over the radio. She helped me once, and I thought it was time to help someone else. Relief washed over Luciana and the others. Logan, relieved but contemplative, listened as Sarah said. What happened in the past is regrettable, but it's no reason to give up everything. Wes was comforting Janice, who finally realized she was saved. John was still on the hilltop, helping kill zombies. When one crept up behind him, Naomi realizes in time and is about to shoot. But someone takes out the zombie anyway. It was Jacob. Annie had brought in two helpers. Victor and Alicia finally arrived early in the morning. They'd been running all night. And their walkie-talkies were dead. Janice attempted to call Alicia's name as they entered. Seeing Janice unharmed, they too sighed in relief. Janice was touched, knowing they had raced to save her. A rare act of kindness in the apocalypse. Alicia was surprised to see Wes. Wes said, I saw your graffiti on the tree. You're right, there should be hope in this society. Janice said, I come from a community that would probably kill me right away if they found me. Alicia says I don't care who those people are. You're one of us now. They're not going to bother you anymore. At the oil refinery, after a night's struggle, the zombie threat was neutralized, and the fire was extinguished. They gathered in the middle of the quarry, only for Logan's men to suddenly emerge from all around. Seeing people clearing zombies, they had hidden nearby. Logan urged Doris to lower her gun, realizing it was time to end the charade. Doris says you said we could go to paradise if we got the oil fields. Logan suggested they could still go, urging them to lower their guns. Reluctantly, Doris complied. Logan confessed he and Clayton had started the trucker organization together, never doubting their mission. Then a few more shots rang out and all of Logan's men were shot in the head. Naomi quickly spotted the shooters, several horseback riders on the hilltop. A new crisis loomed as both sides faced off. A group of horseback riders approached. John and the others ready with guns, but the newcomers were too many. Dozens of armed individuals led by a striking woman. More armed people arrived. Sarah asked, why did you kill Logan? Virginia. The leader, said they had to, they don't normally kill easily, but Logan has become an unstable force they can't trust. Naomi questioned how much Virginia knew about them. Virginia revealed she'd seen their documentary and observed them for a long time, admiring their work, but she criticized their small-scale efforts. Unable to make a significant impact, Luciana said, who are you to tell us what to do? Sarah says we don't take advice from murderers either. Virginia introduced themselves as the pioneers. Dwight gave a mocking smile. He used to be the saviors. Virginia continued, explaining that they aimed to establish a network in the apocalypse. 
setting up outposts in every location, they would be responsible for managing everything at each site, and she believed they were doing a very good job of it. Naomi was baffled by Virginia's intentions. Virginia said, in a hundred years, people might look back at our actions as cruel and heartless, but they'll also see us as great pioneers. I can help you achieve your dreams, you just need to manage the oil fields and provide us with gasoline, Sarah bluntly replied. You can shove that suggestion right up your, Naomi added. We've seen how you treat your partners, Virginia retorted. We only eliminate the useless, Dwight firmly said. We'll make our own way. If you want gasoline, refine it yourself, Virginia, visibly annoyed, warned that their importance would diminish if they didn't provide gasoline. She signaled her men to prepare to shoot, ready to turn Sarah and her group into Swiss cheese at her command. But they showed no fear, ready to make the aggressors pay a price even in death. Virginia seemed surprised by their fearlessness. Luciana, watching Virginia's hand poised in the air, stepped forward, unwilling to let her companions die in vain. She suggested staying behind to let the others leave. Being well versed in refining oil, John argued against it, saying they had survived worse. Luciana insisted it wasn't necessary for all of them to die there, as they had much more to do. Virginia readily agreed to the deal. At Luciana's request, they were allowed to take a truckload of oil. Luciana urged Naomi to use the oil to find a settlement, proving those people wrong. Then Luciana stayed behind as the others drove away. Naomi looks at Luciana and resolves that she will bring Luciana back. Everything happening at the oil fields was unknown to Althea and Morgan, who had traveled far to the west. Well beyond the range of communication, Althea mentioned they only had enough gasoline for a day's journey and should return to the convoy soon, but Morgan insisted on dropping a few more boxes. As Althea was packing up the camera, she suddenly sensed something amiss and became alert. Morgan didn't know what was happening but sensed trouble. Althea realized that one of their three fuel barrels had been stolen. A man appeared near a car, looking around anxiously before adding the stolen gasoline to his vehicle. Althea has now reached behind the man and says that the battery is probably dead. The startled man pulled out a knife, seeking some semblance of safety. Althea says that even if you put petrol in the car, it won't start, they just want the oil back. Morgan quietly approached, urging the man not to panic. The man, faced with this situation, was overwhelmed. In this apocalypse, human morality had eroded, and anything was possible. Morgan said, don't be nervous, we just want our petrol back, we can sit down and talk about it. Under Morgan's calming influence, the man's emotions gradually steadied, and he eventually placed his knife on the ground. That's when Althea signaled Morgan to look in the distance. The man turned, panic-stricken, muttering, they found me. Four armed men appeared at the end of the road, looking menacing. Morgan quickly ushered them into the car for cover. They were soon lying in the car, afraid to make a sound. The men on horseback are obviously looking for something, and they're splitting up. Althea, intrigued by the unfolding story, turned on her camera and raised the lens. Soon, she spotted the horseback riders through her viewfinder and signaled their numbers to Morgan. As the men approached their hiding place, Althea reluctantly retracted her camera. She then noticed the gas cap was still on the ground, a giveaway if spotted. Taking a risk, Althea opened the car door. The horseback rider was now less than 20 meters away. Struggling, she reached for the cap, just inches away. Inside the car, the tension was palpable as the rider drew nearer. Althea is also struggling to get the cover. As the rider turned the corner, Althea managed to get back inside just in time. The man stopped beside their car. Inside, they dared not make a sound to avoid detection. The horse's breath fogged up the glass. The man checked his reflection in the car window but failed to notice Morgan and Althea inside. When his companion called out, he rode off after them. With the man gone, they breathed a sigh of relief. Tom, under Althea's recording, shared his background. He said, My name's Tom. I come from an apartment complex housing dozens of people, most of whom lived there before the apocalypse. I was the chairman of the homeowners association before the world went to hell. When the zombie virus broke out, everyone looked to me. They needed a leader, but I wasn't cut out for it. Just lucky, I guess. We survived thanks to the building's solid security system. At first, we used the swimming pool for water filtration and the rooftop garden for growing vegetables. Then, my luck ran out. The water supply started failing, the vegetables rotted, the walls cracked, and the roof began to leak. Just when we were about to abandon the place, the horseback riders showed up. Morgan and Althea initially thought these people were attackers, but they offered to help. Tom continued. They could provide a clean water system, food, and techniques for growing vegetables. They could fix the walls, everything. 
However, they deemed me an incompetent leader, they claimed they were building a future world system and that a waste like me didn't deserve to live. So, I escaped, and they've been hunting me since. The one thing I'm worried about is my sister, Janice. She's still in the apartment, and I'm afraid they'll kill her because of me. Althea was stirred by this, especially Tom's mention of building the future, reminiscent of Isabel, a woman she'd encountered before, wearing strange armor. We'll save Janice, Althea asserted. Tom's former place, Paradise Hill Apartments, looked pretty decent. The horseback riders had made it their temporary abode. Althea filmed it all from a distance, now plotting a way to sneak in. She was eager to find out if this was related to Isabel's group, as they shared a similar vision for the future. That night, Morgan and Althea lured a zombie to the apartment entrance. The guards were used to this, and killing approaching zombies was one of their duties. As one moved to kill it, two figures quietly slipped through the gate, watching the zombies approach. The duty officer sighed deeply, seemingly accustomed to such sights. Just as he was about to deal with the zombies, two figures quietly slipped through the main gate unnoticed. The guards didn't notice. The figures were Morgan and Althea. On a mission to rescue Tom's sister Janice, the entire estate was eerily quiet. As they reached the stables, they heard a car returning. They had to hide behind a pile of hay. A truck drove in through the gate, passing the stables, followed by a large group of people. Morgan recognized the truck as the oil tanker from the oil fields. Why was the oil tanker here? It seemed there might have been a conflict between the convoy and these people. Morgan worried about his teammates. Morgan wanted to confront them to understand the situation, believing any problem with the convoy was his responsibility. He had been avoiding returning to the convoy, but Althea warned that they would kill him if he went out. Morgan asked how she knew this. Althea said she couldn't reveal her source, but she had encountered people who spoke of building a bigger, stronger future, she suspected this organization might be collaborating with them, ready to eliminate any obstacles, Morgan decided they should split up, he would search for Janice while Althea sought the truth she was after, quickly finding the room described by Tom, Morgan entered, it was silent, with an open window, at that moment, Morgan heard a noise that came from behind the door, he opened the door on his guard to find a male zombie with a spoon stuck in his chest, Morgan, trying to be quiet, pushed the zombie onto the balcony to create distance, preparing to kill it. But the balcony railing broke, and the zombie fell from the second floor. Morgan quickly contacted Althea, suggesting Janice might have dealt with her attacker and escaped the apartment. He said they needed to leave immediately. Meanwhile, Althea discovered something in a room a large network on a map, with some locations marked with keys. Their significance unknown. The patrolling guards hadn't noticed the fallen zombie, hiding in a corner. Althea was suddenly attacked by the zombie, pushing her into a swimming pool, struggling in the water, where she had no foothold. Althea found it extremely difficult to fight back. She could only grapple with the zombie in the water, doing her best to avoid being bitten. Fortunately, Morgan arrived in time, jumping into the water to kill the zombie. He helped Althea out of the water, saying they needed to leave, but when they turned around, Several people were waiting for them by the pool. With the petrol their generator was up and running and the lights were illuminating the flat. They were like fish on a chopping board. Surprisingly, they were not tortured, which was completely against what they had expected given the group's previous behavior in hunting down Tom. Virginia then came in from outside and started to praise the way the Althea documentary had been publicized, and then asked Morgan what they were doing here. Morgan replied that they were looking for Janice, to which Virginia, with a knowing smile, said it seemed they had met Tom. Althea questioned Virginia about why she had to kill Tom, to which Virginia coldly stated that she was trying to protect the place and Tom was useless in her eyes, implying that the useless should be eliminated. Morgan learned from Virginia that John and the others were safe, which relieved him. Virginia continued to preach her ideology, claiming they were helping others, but their value lay in the future. Althea now wants to know if these people are connected to Isabel and asks Virginia if they have a helicopter. Virginia dismissed the idea, saying they couldn't possibly acquire such equipment. The next day, Virginia let Morgan and Althea go without causing them trouble, telling them the doors were always open for them. She suggested that the footage Althea shot could be shown to more people to accelerate their progress towards the future. Virginia even gifted Morgan a new stick since his old one had broken and he hadn't found one that felt right since. Morgan and Althea left the place, uncertain of Janice's whereabouts, deciding to return to their convoy. On the road, Morgan resolved to face his inner turmoil, especially since he had started developing feelings for Grace during a previous outing. However, 
He had been distancing himself from the convoy in grace due to the unresolved grief of losing his wife and son. After some persuasion from Althea, Morgan was ready to open up and talk to Grace about the future. Grace? Grace, if you're hearing this, tell me where you are, I need... When Morgan tried to contact Grace, he was answered by Daniel, who informed him that he and Grace were on their way back to the convoy. But Grace was not in good condition. Morgan eventually spoke to Grace, who was weak and realized that the worst might be happening, possibly due to radiation exposure. Morgan asked for an address and said he'd be there as soon as he could. Fortunately, Grace was stable for the moment, and Morgan successfully brought her back to the convoy. Naomi explained that she was uncertain if Grace's condition was due to radiation, as she was dehydrated and couldn't diagnose the exact illness. Morgan felt guilty for having left Grace. Tom also joined Morgan's group, finding a stark difference between them and the people he had encountered before. To Tom's surprise, he found his sister at the convoy, the very woman who had been trapped at the truck stop. This reinforced their belief in the immense nobility of what Morgan and his team were doing. However, unexpectedly, Virginia also started using documentaries for propaganda, which infuriated Althea to the point of smashing the television. This was a group in the post-apocalyptic world calling themselves the Pioneers, who took it upon themselves to help others rebuild the world. Those they had helped were all singing their praises. People who had once suffered from hunger and displacement were now living peaceful and prosperous lives. All thanks to Virginia, Virginia declared their mission to rebuild a new world, saying, If you see someone dressed like me, don't be afraid, we are here to help. If your group needs help, contact us on Channel 5. Althea and the others watched this on a TV at a truck stop. Tom knew very well that the reality was not as the video portrayed. They only took in those who were useful. Althea, infuriated that her documentary idea had been plagiarized, smashed the TV in anger. There's not much petrol left in the tanker. The convoy's urgent task was to find a place to settle down. They had searched the surrounding areas but found no suitable location to rebuild their home. During their discussion, a zombie approached, and Dwight quickly dealt with it. Dwight found something on the zombie, a badge identifying him as a sheriff from Ham Canyon. John recalled that Ham Canyon was a rather old-fashioned place with no electricity or modern facilities, but with plenty of houses, isolation, and even a fish pond. Upon hearing John's description, everyone had a mental image of the place and felt it might be their final destination. However, they had just enough fuel to get there, but Grace's body started to deteriorate again. Naomi called out to Grace, who seemed to have lost consciousness. Morgan waited anxiously as Naomi reported that Grace's heart was beating too fast and she was severely dehydrated. She needed an four immediately to find medication. The convoy had to take a detour. Fortunately, Althea found the needed medicine in a house, almost losing her life in the process. This was why people steadfastly followed Morgan's team. They never abandoned anyone in trouble. With the timely four, Grace began to recover. Janice noted pointedly that Virginia's group would never have taken a detour for a sick person and might even have killed her. Tom also said that Morgan's team was the real future and he was glad to be a part of it. Dwight mentioned that they found the medicine Grace needed and only lost some time. But they didn't lose anything of value. John had been shot once and was never treated as a burden. Many in the team had almost lost themselves in the apocalypse. But Morgan's belief had brought them together to do something meaningful. However, they encountered another problem en route. The bridge was the only way to the canyon, and it was clearly in disrepair. Only the armored vehicle and one truck managed to cross safely. Luckily, the oil tanker retreated in time, avoiding an accident. Alicia noted that the wooden planks of the bridge were too old to bear the weight of the oil tanker. Without the tanker, the convoy could not reach its destination, and there were no other bridges nearby to cross the river. Just then, the ropes holding the bridge began to collapse, indicating it was even more fragile than they thought. Morgan urgently called for everyone to retreat. His leadership was crucial at this moment. He calmly directed everyone, telling Sarah not to move the oil tanker hastily as the pressure change might cause a collapse. He instructed everyone to transfer the oil into smaller containers and then to cross the bridge on foot, keeping a 10-meter distance between each person, and at that moment... Free! Hey, Morgan! Morgan, we got company! A car burst out of the jungle, and it was Virginia who arrived. She said with a smile, Looks like you need help. Everyone looked at Virginia, uncertain of her intentions. Morgan asked, How did you know we were here? Virginia replied without hesitation, I've been monitoring you. I'm impressed you've come this far with so little fuel, but searching for medicine for a dying woman is foolish. Morgan questioned, what do you want? Virginia said, 
we're expanding passionately and need good people to join us. Tom immediately retorted. You wanted to kill me. Virginia responded. I'd do it again if I had the chance. Killing you would only prove you're a burden. I'm going to treat everyone differently depending on what they do best. Dwight interjected. Don't bother. We've already refused you. Virginia tempted. What if I told you I've been searching for your wife? Dwight's emotions got the best of him, as this was a sensitive topic for him. Fortunately, Morgan intervened to calm him down. Virginia says one of us met with your wife a few months ago and she's worried about you and I'd like you to join us. Morgan cut her off. Our way of doing things is different from yours and will continue to be. Virginia disagreed. We have the same goal but different methods. The future won't be on your side. Anyone who wants to try a new way can join me. It was clear Virginia was trying to poach for Morgan's team. Morgan said to his people. Anyone who wants to go with Virginia can freely choose. There was hardly any hesitation among the convoy. Dwight declared. Our choice is clear. They know what kind of people Virginia's group is. Virginia smiles a little perfunctorily. Clearly annoyed. Her men got the hint and fired shots into the sky. Then Virginia warned. I just saw a group of zombies at the crossroads. You'll be their lunch. If you can't hold out, call us for help. After that, Virginia drove away. Their immediate priority was to quickly organize everyone to cross the bridge. As zombies had already appeared in their line of sight, Morgan had to arrange the fighters to hold off the zombies to prepare for their retreat. The vehicles couldn't be taken along, so they used them to build a defensive line at the bridgehead, allowing others to evacuate safely. Those capable of fighting were on the front lines, battling the zombies. Under their coordination, everyone maintained a gap and orderly fled to the other side. But the zombies were too many and soon breached the defensive line formed by the vehicles. As the team leader, Morgan was the first to stand in the breach. Trying to let everyone cross the bridge, he retreated as he fought. As more zombies climbed onto the bridge, multiple sections began to collapse. The tanker can't be saved. They can only guarantee the safety of the personnel. Morgan urged Tom to stop filming and leave quickly, but Tom insisted on staying behind to film, wanting to show others the kind of team they were. At that moment, Tom tripped on the damaged floor. Janice was frantic as zombies got closer to him. Then the truck at the end of the bridge and the zombies caused the bridge to collapse. Tom smiled, thinking that good people have better luck. As he prepared to get up and continue filming, everyone was tense and urged him not to film but to run. Yet, Tom insisted on showing others what the team was doing. Unfortunately, the worst happened. They could only bury Tom's body by the roadside. All their supplies were left on the other side of the bridge. They considered Ham Canyon their last hope. The remaining 20 miles had to be covered on foot. Althea insisted on documenting the entire process, determined to prove Virginia wrong. After four hours of walking, they finally saw the sign for the canyon, feeling like they had found hope. But upon reaching the town, their hope was shattered once again. This group, filled with hope and having endured many hardships, sought only to find a haven in this post-apocalyptic world. But what met their eyes was a dense crowd of zombies. Janice couldn't believe what she was seeing in the distance, and everyone else was in disbelief too. They had put everything on the line to get here, only to face such a grim outcome, and a wave of negativity spread among them. Alicia insisted they couldn't give up, especially after everything they had been through, including Tom's sacrifice. Charlie suggested going back to the bridge, but that was unrealistic. They were exhausted and returning was impossible. Victor suggested they had another option. Althea immediately turned off the camera, realizing Victor meant seeking help from Virginia. She didn't want to record this, as it negated everything they had done. But in reality, it was just Victor voicing this option, and the majority of the group had tacitly accepted it. They had sick people and children who couldn't just wait to die. Everyone fell silent, grappling with the harsh reality that ideals and reality often differ, and most choose survival. Morgan felt bad, but it seemed to be the only way out. Reluctantly, Althea agreed to contact Virginia. You call her. There's no going back. Dwight warned that joining Virginia meant they might one day be unable to face themselves. Dwight began his self-redemption when he met Morgan's team, finding a renewed sense of purpose among them. If Morgan and others decide to rely on Virginia, he will choose to leave. He would rather die in the wilderness than return to a life like his previous one with the saviors. Seeing this Naomi apologized profusely for her decision making as a housekeeper which had got them into the situation. Morgan picked up the walkie-talkie, though no one was happy about it. They silently consented. He began calling Virginia. Virginia, if you're listening, 
We need your help. What will happen to this group of people? Do they really want to give up what they have been doing? Dwight, having left the group, ran frantically until, exhausted, he finally collapsed to the ground. He looked up and saw that he had arrived at the place where Tom was buried. At this time, the walkie-talkie rings and his wife's voice comes out. Dwight quickly responded, but the walkie-talkie only repeated, Dwight, can you hear me? No matter how Dwight replied, it was as if the walkie-talkie couldn't hear him. Realizing it might be a hallucination, Dwight threw the device away in frustration. Looking at a distant armored vehicle, Dwight attempted to open the door. Suddenly, he heard a noise and quickly hid under the vehicle. He saw someone on horseback approaching and prepared his weapon, ready for an ambush. Surrender was not an option. To his surprise, there was no rider, just horses without owners. Dwight took a wary look behind him. Again there were horses with no owners. He didn't know where the horses had come from, but Dwight was happy because it meant something could be done. Meanwhile, Morgan was still discussing details with Virginia. When she learned of Morgan's location, Virginia said, Ham Canyon was once the largest survival community I've seen. With 260 people, their fish pond has dried up, but their leader refused my help. I didn't expect it to end up like this. Morgan requested, we need your help to clear the zombies so we can live here. But Virginia responded, that's impossible. I'll distribute your people where they're needed. I can only assure the safety of most of them. I can't manage those without value. Should I come to pick you up then? She asked. Morgan was silent. He looked at the crowd in the distance and then at the zombies. And Morgan said what he didn't want to say. Yeah. Then Morgan said in front of the crowd that he was sorry. They heard the neighing of horses in the distance and, thinking it was an enemy attack, grabbed their weapons and rushed out. To their relief and smiles, it was Dwight returning with several horses. Dwight suggested, we might be able to survive here. The group was confused at first. Dwight explained, don't you see? The horses I found near the armored vehicle mean there's a water source nearby. We can live here. This made the group realize Virginia's claim about the dried up fish pond was a lie. However, the situation was still grim, with countless zombies and a fence that might not hold much longer. They were divided internally. Victor said, even if we kill all the zombies, where will we find food and medicine? He still leaned toward joining Virginia, but Dwight countered, if there's water, there will be fish. Daniel added, there's another big problem. Virginia won't leave without a fight. Dwight insisted they shouldn't join them, fearing they might become the next Tom. I owe my life to you all. I really want to keep going. John suggested, we clear this place and then fight them, but we're low on weapons and ammo. Virginia could easily defeat us with half her people, and the fence is about to collapse. Persuaded by Dwight, they decided to hold out a little longer. Morgan, looking at the sign, came up with a plan. The plan was to divert the zombie horde and concentrate them near the armored vehicle, hidden from view. Virginia and her people, upon seeing the abandoned armored vehicle on the road, would certainly not give up. They would then use the large army of zombies against Virginia, solving both problems at once. After the zombies were lured away, the group entered the small town. Althea effortlessly killed a zombie and discovered something on its body. With the zombies gone, the place was eerily empty. Though somewhat run down, a bit of renovation could make it quite suitable for living. There was even a church that could serve as a temporary gathering point for everyone. Sarah noticed Althea seemed hesitant to speak, fiddling with the item in her hand. Althea revealed, I know where those horses came from. Look, these are what I found on that zombie. They're Virginia's team's identification tags. It seems her people were here and died here, she added. Meanwhile, several others were leading the zombies forward on horseback. Grace has not been well and Morgan is worried about her, so he takes Grace with him wherever he goes. John was confident that this operation would succeed not only diminishing Virginia's arrogance but also forcing them to waste ammunition on clearing zombies. Unaware, they were nearing an armored vehicle. Dwight suggested a plan. There's a lawn over the hill. We can lead the zombies there and lie in wait. It was their route. And seeing the armored car, Virginia and her party were sure to stop. That's when we strike hard. Morgan began assigning tasks. Daniel and Victor were to signal from their position, while the rest led the zombies to the other side of the hill. Without delay, Victor and Daniel went to find a hiding spot. And the rest continued with the zombies. Naomi thanked Dwight acknowledging his choice to stand with them despite the chance to find his wife through Virginia's group. Dwight confessed he once thought he heard his wife's voice over the radio, possibly a hallucination from exhaustion. But now, I won't lose myself in the search for her. When we reunite, 
I want to proudly tell her about the meaningful things I've done, not like before, doing terrible things in research. Dwight reflected, I also don't want a Virginia hanging over us when we reunite, he added. Then, they turned a corner, leading the zombies towards the other side of the hill, preparing to ambush Virginia's group. Daniel and Victor soon hid near the armored vehicle, ready to signal John once Virginia lingered there. The others positioned themselves around the zombie horde to prevent dispersion. John kept a close eye on his girlfriend Naomi, knowing the risk involved in attracting zombies. One wrong move, an escape would be nearly impossible. They awaited Daniel's signal to lead the zombies towards the armored vehicle. Soon, Virginia's vehicle appeared in Daniel's binoculars. Victor swiftly whistled into the walkie-talkie, a pre-arranged code to avoid eavesdropping, followed closely by two more vehicles. Hearing Victor's signal, they began leading the zombies towards the armored vehicle. Dwight was in charge of attracting the stray zombies, but his horse seemed to become temperamental and somewhat uncontrollable. As expected, Virginia's group stopped their vehicles. The armored car, too valuable to abandon, had previously been used by Morgan's group to cross a bridge. After some distance, it ran out of fuel, but now it served as an excellent bait. Virginia, eyeing the prized vehicle, ordered her people to refuel the armored car and drive it away. Then, Daniel spotted someone through his binoculars. Victor took the binoculars and saw that they were letting Luciana drive the small tanker. This complicated matters. John's walkie-talkie whistles again and they don't understand what's going on. Then Daniel says the operation is cancelled and to hold the zombies back because they've brought Luciana with them, with no other choice. As their own person was there, they had to turn around with the zombies. Dwight's horse was circling in one place and soon got surrounded by several zombies. Dwight had to resort to hacking at the zombies with his axe. Naomi noticed Dwight's predicament. He was nearly engulfed by the zombie horde, making rescue difficult. The zombies crowding around Dwight increased in number, and it seemed he would soon become their prey. Left with no other option, Dwight stood on the horse's back and leaped towards the distance. The horse was overpowered and brought down by the zombies, who swarmed over it. The others, unable to see Dwight, kept calling out, fearing the worst. Luckily, they saw Dwight running towards the distance, and because of his injured leg, his running speed was not fast. After Dwight had run for some distance, a river blocked his way. It was a dead end. Fortunately, John and the others caught up just in time. They spread out to distract the zombies and alleviate the pressure on Dwight. Carefully probing their surroundings, they managed to attract a few zombies. However, many still pursued Dwight. Despite the escalating danger, Dwight continued to shout urging his teammates to ignore him and focus on controlling the zombie horde. He remained adamant about having them lead the zombies towards the armored vehicle. John directly told him to shut up and not to make any noise, otherwise he couldn't be saved at all. Dwight, while killing the zombies, said, I know exactly what I'm talking about. He believes that living under the rule of people of different faiths distorts beliefs and that bringing zombies there is the right thing to do. Dwight then headed towards the water's edge, not wanting Morgan and the others to waste time on him. Morgan, believing in not abandoning teammates, dismounted and followed Dwight. Dwight's leg injury was severe, and escape seemed impossible. Morgan was forced to kill the advancing zombies, but more kept coming from behind. John and the others rushed over, it's impossible for them to abandon their teammates. That's why Dwight insisted on not surrendering. He couldn't let go of his team. Everyone deserves to be saved. John came up with a plan to escape the zombies and said, You two hide. We'll give the zombies a bath. Dwight and Morgan quickly hid in the bushes nearby. John and the others then rode their horses across the river. Grace and the rest kept calling out from the water, effectively attracting the zombies into the river. The strong current of the river was too much for the zombies. Sweeping them away downstream, the zombies that were originally used against Virginia's team were taken away by the current. This left them without their key advantage. The zombie horde, in any conflict with Virginia, if there's a conflict with Virginia, they won't be able to defend themselves. Morgan remarked, we're still alive, and that's enough. On Daniel's side, Victor has the armored car's starter and is ready to negotiate a deal. Without the starter, the armored car was useless. Even with fuel, back in town, they discovered several bodies, former residents, all killed by gunshot wounds, a testament to Virginia's brutal methods. Althea concluded that if they refused Virginia's help, their fate wouldn't be any better. That's where the horses came from. If we fight her, we'll die too. The situation became difficult to handle. They hadn't anticipated Virginia to be so ruthless and inhumane. 
leaving them with no real choices. Alicia, still defiant, wanted to fight back, but Morgan pointed out the stark reality, they were outnumbered, and their only chance, the zombie horde, was gone. Morgan emphasized survival over defeat, insisting on keeping everyone alive rather than surrendering. Dwight challenged the idea, questioning if they were meant to surrender. Morgan continued, asserting that while Virginia could control their movements and even separate them, she could never destroy their spirit. And that's how the team ended, and everyone was a little bummed about it. There was one more thing they had to do before Virginia arrived. Alicia and Wes decorated the church for John and Naomi's wedding, a brief respite in their grim reality. Naomi donned a simple green dress, and John wore a sharp suit, with over 30 witnesses, including Charlie playing music. Daniel watched with a mix of envy and nostalgia, as if witnessing his own daughter's wedding. Jacob, the pastor, officiated but noticed John's lack of rings. John could only say that he hadn't found a replacement. Dwight stepped forward, offering his and his wife's wedding rings, expressing gratitude to John and Naomi. Naomi misinterpreted this as Dwight giving up on finding his wife. However, Dwight clarified he hadn't given up and wouldn't let Virginia use his wife as a bargaining chip, vowing to find her in his own way. John didn't hesitate to accept Dwight's good intentions, they exchanged rings and officially became husband and wife. Everyone around applauded, this ceremony was incredibly important to them, it also offered a glimmer of hope to the other survivors. With Charlie's music and Daniel's singing, smiles appeared on everyone's faces, Althea captured all these moments, the sunlight streaming through the roof onto the stage seemed like a blessing from the sky, creating a beautifully warm and intimate scene, but the tranquility was shattered by the sound of a car horn outside, without a doubt. Virginia and her people had arrived. They had to take their weapons and go out to negotiate. Morgan, as the leader, stepped out with a few others. The first vehicle to come along was the armored car, which Victor had obviously given them the starter for. A figure appeared above the armored car. None other than the hypocritical Virginia. I heard from Victor that you guys were up to something. Too bad it didn't work out, she said. It seemed Victor had traded the starter for some advantage of his own. Morgan replied, we will accept your help. Virginia was pleased with Morgan's attitude, but Morgan added, You have to take all of us, including the sick Grace and the elderly, weak, and disabled. Provide medical services immediately. We all go, or none of us do. We need assurance that we won't lose anyone, otherwise, it's a no-go. Even one person less is unacceptable, or it'll be a loss for both sides. Virginia looked at a determined Morgan for a good 10 seconds before reluctantly agreeing to Morgan. She needed many hands for expansion. Then hurry up and bring the rest out. We have a long way to go, Virginia said. That night, the children were put into a truck. Dwight in another. This was Virginia's shrewdness. She wouldn't let familiar faces stay together, avoiding many potential issues. Even Sarah and Wendell, siblings, were forced to separate. Alicia also confronted Victor asking if it was he who helped Virginia fix the armored vehicle. Victor replied that it was inevitable, and he might as well curry favor with her, hoping they could cause major internal destruction later. Alicia's signature weapon was confiscated. She had no choice. The situation was beyond her control. Reluctantly, Alicia boarded the vehicle. Daniel urged Victor not to be the same liar when he got there. Charlie was very reluctant to part with Daniel. Daniel assured her that everything would be all right and that he would find a way to reach her. John and his newlywed spouse also couldn't escape the fate of separation. In the end, only Morgan and Grace were left. Not usually one to express his feelings. Morgan finally mustered the courage to confess his love to Grace. Grace was deeply moved by his words. Knowing about Morgan and Grace's relationship, Virginia deliberately brought a doctor to take Grace away. Finally, only Morgan and Virginia remained. Virginia just looked at him. Morgan asked where she intended to take him. Virginia, however, stated that he needed to stay here as his influence among the people was too significant and she had to ensure the stability of her future. Seeing Virginia's actions, Morgan seemed to have guessed her intentions. He appeared unmoved but had clenched his stick tightly in his right hand. Morgan chose to strike first. As the gunshot rang out, they both fell to the ground. Virginia was dazed by Morgan's stick strike. Morgan, shot in the chest, lay in agony. About a minute later, Virginia had regained her senses. Morgan struggled to reach his weapon, but the bleeding from his chest and the pain made it difficult to exert any strength. Virginia, just to be safe, threw Morgan's stick far away. She then took a handgun from a zombie's body. Morgan could only drag his injured body in a desperate struggle. Virginia raised the gun again, ready to finish him off. At that moment, Morgan calmed down and simply looked at Virginia plainly. Virginia said, 
I just really hate your face. The situation startled Virginia. Perhaps it was the age of the handgun that allowed Morgan to narrowly escape death. Just then, Virginia's walkie-talkie crackled to life with the voice of the doctor from earlier. He announced that the woman's examination results were in. Morgan, thinking Grace was seriously ill and would be abandoned, pleaded with Virginia not to harm Grace. No matter how sick Grace is, please don't hurt her, he implored. But the doctor revealed that Grace wasn't ill. She was pregnant. Morgan was in disbelief. Virginia, however, showed a sly smile. The doctor estimated the pregnancy to be about three or four months along, noting only some malnutrition. At that moment, a group of zombies, likely attracted by the gunshot, emerged behind Virginia. She picked up her hat, ran to her car, and drove away from the scene. With such injuries, Morgan's fate seemed sealed. Aware of his impending end, Morgan spoke into the walkie-talkie. To anyone who can hear me, my companions, the battles we fought, the tough choices we made, were for everyone's survival, for now and the future, if you're listening, Grace, you must survive, to everyone who can hear this message, and with that, the fifth season of Fear the Walking Dead comes to a dramatic close.